when they go off of it, all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, they're really into their partner and they're super attracted to them. But for some women, they go off of it. And even though they're having this increased desire, they're realizing that their partner isn't really what they want. There's like a ton of research. Women who are using hormonal birth control, they're at a greater risk of developing anxiety and depression. How long does it take actually getting off the pill before your brain goes, hey, I'm thinking differently? I've met women, they're like a drone. They're just like work, 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 work. They go off the pill and all of a sudden they realize that they want more work-life balance. We decide that it's a good idea to give teenage girls whose brains are still developing something that shuts down their brain ovarian access. And we don't think this is going to affect brain development. As a guy, I really didn't think that I would do a show on slash love a book about birth control, but but here we are. And it's, I guess because as a guy, and I'm sure you've heard this a million times, I kind of grew up just being like, well, I don't ever, I mean, this isn't something I really need to know about. If, if you get a girlfriend and you're sexually active, she takes a pill or something and you just kind of like, that's it. It's not really my, I hate to say not my problem, but it's like not really my concern, even though obvi for obvious reasons, all men who date or are active with or partnered up with women should be concerned about this or are related to women or have, are raising women uh, or have women in their lives. It's just, once you think about it, once you read this book and think about it, it just permeates sort of the whole society in a way that I hadn't thought of before. Yeah, you know, I didn't really think about it either, honestly, um, because every it, I mean, it's so normalized, you know, like like it's it's so common that women get on it and their doctors recommend it for everything ranging from acne to period cramps to, you know, just about anything else. And so even when I was on it, I didn't think much of it. It was just like, oh, okay, I take this and then I don't get pregnant. That's great. Yes. And then I just kind of was going on with my life and it wasn't until I went off of it that, and, and I realized how different I felt when I was off it compared to when I was on it, that I really started to ask the questions of like, well, wait, what am I actually doing? Mm -hmm. Like, what have I been doing? Um, and what do, you know, I, and even though I'd always appreciated, um, just because of my, my research background in psychology and I study women and I study hormones, um, I'd always been aware of the fact that hormones are really instrumental in terms of shaping behavior and um, sort of nudging our behavior this way and that way. Um, but I never even connected the dots to think twice about the fact that my hormonal birth control, because it was affecting my hormones, that means it was going to affect me. Right. And the whole um, so, yeah, yeah. So I don't, you know, I don't think that that being a, a guy, um, you know, I, like you're not really thinking too much about it. I think there's also a lot of women who just really don't think too much about it because it's so normalized. There's also this thing that people like me do where we think this is a pill that does one thing to one organ at one time when I want it to. Not like this goes into my whole body and into my bloodstream and it happens to do the right thing over here. And we don't really have any idea what it does all the way over here and in your brain and then in this other area. It's like, ah, we, if somebody doesn't die or like their ears don't fall off, the FDA is like, hey, cool, this looks fine. You know, you don't end up with cancer right away, something. Right. And it's like, we just, but side effects are real. And some of those side effects are are kind of invisible. And I want to talk about some of those. They're, I mean, maybe they're not traditional side effects it was like your ears falling off but side effects like you choose a different partner or you find uh, that you like or feel a certain different way that that's certainly something that we should pay attention to and it seems like the pill almost changes the version of our personality that we express which is a hell of, of a side effect and also something really hard to measure because if they are asking you on the questionnaire do you feel different you might just be like Sure, I guess, unless you have depression, but you're not like, oh, I suddenly don't like my boyfriend as much. You know, you're not going right. to that's not something you're going to even put together necessarily. Right. Well, no, because your brain tells yourself a story about things. Right. It's like you think um, like, wow, my life is worse than it used to be or my boyfriend has sure gotten annoying like we don't really like yeah. tend to equate things to, <laughs> to whatever it is that we're putting into that our might bodies. also be true just fyi i mean it's yeah, these no, aren't it mutually be. exclusive things he might also have gotten more annoying 
Yeah, but it's like the the way that it affects our, our, our brain isn't something that our brain is able to think about. It's like our, our brain just thinks that it's doing its thing and it doesn't realize that some of the inputs that are creating the version of yourself that your brain is creating is is, is something that's different. And so in, in these ways, we have these invisible side effects that, but they can also be really profound where it can do things like um, affect your mental health and just sort of like your general take on the world, like whether you feel positively or negatively. Mm-hmm. And as you noted, even like whether you're attracted to your partner or not, um, because attraction is something that is profoundly affected by our hormonal states. And um, and research has been showing that for several decades now. And then when you add, you know, a different hormonal milieu into the picture, then, of course, that can have the effect of nudging you in and out of attraction with different types of partners. That is a great use of the word milieu by the way. Um, Thanks. I've been working on it I, for months. It's funny because I'm like, wow, you, you just use un, like unironically use that word. And my transcription is, is going to be like, I have no idea what you said here. Can you tell me how to do, spell that? And I'll say, I'll be right back no. because I, yeah. I know actually I cannot. <laughs> I like, no, I'll be I right back. Um, so you, you mentioned your own experience of stopping the pill Tell me about that because, and, and I'm sure this is maybe a few years ago. Although, because the book was written, now it's not a new book. And by the way, if people buy the books, please use the the links in our show notes. It helps support the show. But I read this book quite a while ago and reread it a little more recently. You describe it quite dramatically. This isn't like, oh, one day I'm off this, and it's like, oh yeah, things are slightly different. I mean, you 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 kind of this is a bold underline kind of change in your life. Yeah, it was. So I I went off of it after I'd been on it off. And I'd, I'd gone off it for a little periods of time. Like when I had my children, I was off it. I got pregnant right away with both my kids. And then when I was breastfeeding, I wasn't on it. But as, other than those little blips of time when I was having children and uh, and and feeding them, um, I, I was on it almost nonstop for about 12, 12 years. Wow. And so, yeah, like a really long time. That is a long time. And, yeah, it is. And and then I went off of it and I didn't really think anything of it, honestly, until it was, it was about three months after I discontinued. And I was thinking, I was just feeling really energetic. And I was thinking to myself, I feel alive. Like I feel really uh, alive. And I, I was thinking like I started downloading new music recently. I like downloaded um, Spotify and Pandora. And I was like, listening to new things mm-hmm. for the first time in a really long time, I'd started going to the gym again, um, which is something that I used to love when I was, uh, when I was like in high school mm-hmm. and I, then I kind of fell off of it and it, I would still exercise, but it wasn't like, like I wasn't loving it. It wasn't something that I really enjoyed. And I was enjoying that again. I was like, I was cooking and just like doing things that gave me pleasure. I was noticing men. I was noticing my husband. I was like wanting to have sex more frequently And it was just like, and I just felt like I had this level of dimensionality that I didn't have before. Like, I just felt like all of a sudden I could like feel the full amplitude of being alive. Yeah. And in some ways it was, you know, it was like really good things like, you know, sexual desire and music and pleasure. Um, But it was also like, I noticed that it, you know, I I would, I felt more emotional. Like I, it was like, I could also get more upset. Like things would make me more Mm -hmm. upset. But, um, you know, it it was, it was really interesting for me because it felt like, and I, and I describe it this way in the book, um, but it very much felt like I went from my life as a grayscale, one dimensional drawing. And then all of a sudden I like crawled off the page into like a three dimensional color filled reality. It was just like, oh, Yikes. yes. Yeah. And, and and it was once I sort of recognized how I had felt, I mean, it, it really struck me how different that was. And, 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 you know, since the last time that you and I met, um, I mean, I had only been off the pill for, I don't know, like maybe three years or so. And you and I had met, but you know, more time has passed now because that, that book uh, came out at the end of 2019. Um, another thing that I've really realized in, you know, recent years, it just because it takes a while to build a narrative about sure. yourself, sure. you know, like trying to understand who you are and how you respond to things. Um, but I remember all through my college years and graduate school years and, you know, um, early assistant professor years, I, I'd always had this this belief about myself that I was somebody who was anxious and became really easily overwhelmed by things. And that turns out to just not be true. 
Wow. Because I, 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 it's just not true of me. And, and, and it's been over the last, um, you know, several years that I've realized that that's not a personality trait that I have. Wow. Um, it, 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 it was something that was the result of my birth control. It had to have been because it's, I, I don't feel that way anymore. That's a little scary because you spent 12 years on it, right? If you'd spent like six months on it, you're like, okay, well, oh no, I forgot how I feel. 12 years is a long time to, not have Spotify. I mean, you know, yeah, whatever. no, it's a long time. I know. Well, I know. So, like, so here's just an example of this. And and it used to be that when I was cooking dinner, because even though I wasn't really loving cooking, I was always cooking, um, because I'm I'm into food. And I, I I like I couldn't like cook dinner and have music on in the background. It was just too much. It was overwhelming. It felt overstimulating. And now. You know, I always have to have music. I have music on all the time, like always in the house. And when I'm cooking and I can have it on and have a conversation. And I remember I used to just get overwhelmed or if we were having a party at the house, I'd have to go back in my bedroom and sit alone for a little while for like 20 minutes just to like decompress and you know, because it felt too peopley. Yeah. And, um, and I still don't love, you know, when it's way too peopley, but it's like, so I, I don't feel that feeling of like overwhelmed and, and anxiety that I felt when I used to be on it. And, and I thought that that was who I was. So what and it's not what it, it's such it's such an identity level shift, which is the scary mm-hmm. part, I guess. Um, yeah. And again, like birth control pills are what hormones and receptors for these hormones are all over our body and our brain. So it doesn't just affect your brain. It's it's sure it switches something off in the ovaries or whatever, but like it also changes your the the personality thing is just wild because I I'm guessing virtually nobody who goes to get a prescription for this is even thinking about how their personality might change. They're like, oh, I might get acne or like it says depression. So if I feel really awful, maybe I'll switch out of this. But I don't think people are thinking about these little nuanced things. Like, right. you know, they're, they're going to start to hate Taylor Swift. I mean, that's horrifying. It, that is horrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, but just that, the, that it makes so many little nudges in our body right. is um, it really, it, it is profound. And, and, and when you think about the number of different systems in the body that have receptors for hormones, I mean, it's, it's really astounding. And it's because as women, um, everything in our body and everything that our body does has to change a course a little bit when we're pregnant. It's like our circulatory system has to do a different thing. Our respiratory system has to do a different thing. So we have to take more oxygen in. Our immune system has to do something different because it can't attack a developing baby. I mean, there's like all of these things that have to change what they're doing in response to pregnancy. And the result of that is that our body from head to toe is wired for sex hormone reception. It's like all the cells in on all major systems of the body have receptors for these for for hormones and so when you have all of these systems that are like listening for a hormonal message and all of a sudden you give it a new one i mean that's changing everything that your body does and so you know one of the things that we recently published is uh we did a paper looking at differences between naturally cycling women so women who are not on hormonal birth control and are experiencing regular ovulatory cycles and we looked at them and then we looked at uh, pill takers And we were interested in the inflammatory response to stress because when we're feeling stressed out, in addition to releasing stress hormones, um, our body also releases inflammation. And it does this because um, stress is something that can indicate that you're going to be hurt, that you're going to be physically harmed. And so your body prepares for that. And um, we were really interested, given that you get differences in uh, stress response between pill takers and non, which we can talk about in a moment, we were interested in whether that also leads to differences in inflammatory activity or the activities of the immune system. And it does. You have these very different um, immunological profiles in response to stress between women who are u- using hormonal birth control and women who don't. And um, and one of the things that we know about birth control is that it can increase um, rem- women's risk of developing uh, autoimmunity. And we think that this might be one of the ways that it does this is by changing their inflammatory response and then um, putting them at greater risk. It, the, the inflammatory thing, the autoimmunity, by the way, is that like when your immune system starts attacking your own body? Is that what that is? Because you hear about inflammation. It's, inflammation's almost buzzwordy these days, right? It's like, oh, you gotta eat this, reduce inflammation. Don't eat that, it inflames th- things. But is this, at the, at the core level, is this kind of cortisol response or is it wider than that? 
Well, I, I think that it probably is wider than that. Initially, we were really interested in that process just because of the cortisol response, because what research finds and what research has been finding for several years is that uh, women who are using hormonal birth control tend to have a blunted um, or dysregulated cortisol response to stress. And, um, and, and so like the rest of us, like you and I, if we get stressed out by something, like we have to give a public speech or whatever it is, um, generally our body will start releasing cortisol, and uh, and, and cortisol kind of gets a kind of has a bad reputation just it because does. if you have constant cortisol release, it's not good for you. Like um, because one, what cortisol actually does is it is a sort of uh, a rearranger of metabolic priorities, and so when your body releases cortisol, it's telling your body, hey we are under stress right now. Stop doing everything that you're doing. So don't invest in the immune system. Don't invest in cell repair. Don't invest in growth. Instead, we need to take all of those resources and devote them to potentially having to get away quickly and birthing new neurons in our hippocampus to remember what's going on. Because when stressful things are happening, it usually means it's important and we need to remember it. And so our body essentially pull, stops doing everything that it normally is doing to maintain itself. And then it diverts all of those resources to managing the stressor. And oh, in the short term, that's really good, sure. right? Because in the short term, it's helping you deal with the stressor. And so your body is like ready to go. You've got um, fat and, and, and sugar in your bloodstream. So that way, if you need to run away, you can. All of that's also fueling your brain to be able to think and remember and, and know what you're doing and be really quick on your toes and focus your attention um, but in the long term, if you're releasing cortisol like at high levels for a long period of time, then your body is constantly dumping all of its resources in stress management, and it's not able to do things like protect itself from germs or grow or you know just do regular cell repair. And and because of this, if we have cortisol constantly being released, our body just shuts down the stress response and it says no more stress response for you, and it actually blunts the cortisol response. Um, and, and, and this is why for people who have um, post-traumatic stress disorder or who've experienced any sort of trauma, what you tend to see is that they have this really blunted cortisol response to stress. So you and I, if we give a public speech, we have this big rise in cortisol because our body is preparing ourselves to deal with something stressful. But for people who've experienced trauma, you have no stress response because their body told them no stress for you. Um, and w- what we see with women on the birth control pill is that they look like people who've experienced chronic stress or trauma, um, and they have that blunted cortisol response to stress. And this has led researchers to think that, you know, when we take hormonal birth control, when we're first on it, um, that the progestins or that synthetic progesterone that's in them might be activating our glucocorticoid receptors or the, the receptors in our body that usually pick up cortisol and making our body think that we're under chronic stress. And as a result, the body starts to shut down the stress response. And this is something that um, is obviously not good. Um, And it's something that's related to having problems with regulating your stress response. So you're less able to cope with stress. Um, because that's one of the things that cortisol does is it helps us adaptively deal with stress. And so, your anxiety issues, maybe? Well, exactly. I mean, you know, I think about the fact that I used to get so easily overwhelmed where it was just like system overload mm-hmm. where I was like, oh my gosh, like there's just too much going on. There's too much stimulation, too much whatever, and have to go into another room. And I'm thinking to myself when when I'm reading this this research that finds this blunted cortisol response to stress that this was undoubtedly playing a role. Um, the other thing that's probably playing a role in, you know, uh, when I think about my own experiences and the experiences that so many women have, because there's like a ton of research that shows that women who are using hormonal birth control, that they're at a greater risk of developing anxiety disorders, anxiety problems, and depression, um, especially teenagers. So women who go on it when they're teenagers have the highest risk of these things. And, you know, one of the things that's undoubtedly a contributor is that blunted cortisol response to stress that we just talked about. But another thing that researchers have been paying a lot of attention to and is likely a a really big contributor to um, this increased risk of anxiety and depression is, um, is that you don't get the release of this. There's this neurosteroid called allopregnanolone. And when, which is a really long word, Mm -hmm. um, but when a naturally cycling woman is going through her regular cycle, which 
um, just for people who aren't familiar with what this looks like, um, uh, an average cycle. So let's imagine that there's a 28 day menstrual cycle. Um, the first day of your cycle is the day that you get your period. And at that point, levels of hormones are very low. So you have low levels of estrogen and low levels of progesterone. And then as the egg follicles begin to get stimulated and your body's preparing for the possibility of ovulation, um, that leads to the release of uh, estrogen. And so estrogen levels increase and increase and increase and increase as egg follicles are maturing and one is getting ready to get released. Um, right when that egg fall, like right when that egg is mature, you're at these peak levels of estrogen, and then the egg gets released and is out in the world and pregnancy is possible. And then the empty egg follicle starts releasing this other hormone, progesterone. And progesterone is this, the hormone of the second half of our cycle, so it generally gets released. Um, after ovulation, which happens around day 14 until you get your period. And that hormone, um, when it gets broken down in the body, when it gets metabolized, it releases a neurosteroid called allopregnanolone, which is a really potent stimulator of our brain's GABA receptors. And this is a lot of big words. Yeah. And uh, it's like okay. GABA receptors, allopregnanolone, neurosteroid. But essentially what this does is this wonderful little neurosteroid that gets released um, from progesterone being broken down in the body is it, it causes a neurotransmission in our brain that calms the brain down. So GABA activity in the brain is chill out activity. So things that tend to stimulate GABA release in, in the brain are things like yoga, meditation, cozying up by the fire in your jammies. Um, other things that stimulate GABA receptors are alcohol. Oh, I was going to say wine. And yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Xanax does the same thing. And so all of those things work on that same pathway. And so progesterone actually allows us to create our own internal Xanax and that calms the brain and releases it or, or relaxes it. And, and women who are using hormonal birth control, because they're not getting actual progesterone, they're getting this synthetic progestin that doesn't get metabolized the same way um, because it's actually made out of testosterone instead of being made out of progesterone. Oh, I see. And yeah. And so when it gets broken down in the body, there's no allopregnanolone release. And so your brain never gets that big chill out effect that we get from, um, from real, real deal progesterone. And so there's a lot of research looking into the role that lack of that activity, lack of that neurosteroid, um, contributes to the, the increased, um, anxiety and depression risk that we get in women who are on the pill. Man, that stuff is fascinating. And, and don't worry, I have a smart audience. I I'm usually the weak link when it comes to understanding these <laughs> things. So I appreciate you explaining like I'm five. It's the, the audience usually gets all this stuff. We do have foreign <laughs> listeners though, who are going to be like, Neurosteroid, and they can Google it. This is the it's 2024. Uh, you mentioned in the book that parental investment is higher for women than men, and that kind of goes without saying. But tell us, of course, why the, why this is just for people who are you know jogging and not necessarily critically thinking about everything we're saying, and and also tell us why it's important for what we're discussing with respect to birth control. Yeah, so a parental investment, um, I mean, when we're talking about the minimum, bare minimum levels of investment that a male versus a female have to make in an offspring, um, females are actually defined as females um, in part because they make a larger investment. And that, that investment difference begins um, even before a man and a woman meet. Um, a female has already invested more in reproduction than the man has because eggs are so much more metabolically expensive than sperm. And so females are born with, you know, a finite number of eggs. Each one is, I forget what it is, it's something like a thousand or a million times larger than a sperm cell. So it's like metabolically a lot more expensive. Um, and so females, um, before, you know, they, they've already, their initial investment, which is just their gamete or their sex cell, is larger and more costly than what gets invested by a male. And so you get that initial difference in investment. But then for a, a human, you know, we're mammals and females internally gestate. And so a woman, you know, if there's going to be a pregnancy, um, the minimum amount of investment that a woman has to make in order to reproduce is nine months. And the minimum investment that a man has to make to reproduce is like what? Like the time it 
I mean, talk, you know, we know, we all know it's about it 35 twice. seconds, right? Yeah. Right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Say right. If you do it twice. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so th- there's just a, a really big difference. There's a big asymmetry in the, in the minimum amounts that have to be invested. And, you know, and, and this is important for the current conversation because one of the things that makes biological males and biological females different from one another is these differences in investment. And historically, throughout our long history as a species, females have been um, the ones who have to invest more in, in reproduction. And, and so for women, um, sex historically has been something that's very costly for us because anytime that we have sex, it could potentially lead to having to invest in you know, not only a nine-month pregnancy, but then subsequent time spent lactating. And there's a possibility that this guy that just knocked you up Mm -hmm. isn't going to stick around and care for this child. And so women have had to, over the course of history, be a lot more choosy and discriminating and also, you know, sort of delay sex and be a little bit more sexually coy just to try to figure out whether or not this person that they're with is somebody who's going to be able to help them care for an offspring. Because human offspring are notoriously uh, like a black hole of need. Right. <laughs> like, yes. I'm going like through that right now. <laughs> yeah. Twice. No kidding. I mean, yeah, no. And trust me with teenagers, it gets even, it's even worse. Oh, don't tell twice. me this. I was like, it's I can't so, wait till they're older and then they don't need me to. Yeah, no, maybe not. Yeah, no, it's, it's a little bit of it. It's a different set of problems, but um, I mean, it, it's so hard to raise, especially young children and children, like as you noted, I mean, they're, they're so, they require so much investment. And so sex for women historically has been something that is very costly um, and and is going to necessitate necessitate a lot of investment and and the same has not been true for That's for true. men. Yeah, I mean and guys are giving this stuff away, right? Like anywhere yeah. that they'll take it, we're 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 tr- we're giving it away. It's like t- take it off the lot right now, and oh, yeah, right. women not so much. That's why, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll leave right. right there. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, because th- that it, it sets up all of these asymmetries between the sexes because it's like you know all of a sudden the cost of sex you mm-hmm. have this big asymmetry between the and the cost of sex. Right. For women, um, because pregnancy is a possibility, sex is very costly. For men, it's not. It's just not costly. There's also differences in the like sort of reproductive opportunities that you're going to be passing up if you would agree to sex with this person compared to that person. And if you're a woman, if you have sex with this person and that ends up not to be your person, you're stuck with nine months with right. this, you know, in, in this other person. You know, if you're a man, you yeah, can you have need... sex with 10 different women and have 10 different children. Yeah. You, you know, need 10 in minutes in a washcloth and the washcloth is yeah. optional. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like the course of an afternoon. So you get all of these, um, all of these big differences between men and women that ultimately stem from the fact that we have these differences in the minimum level of investment yeah. and why this is interesting, um, in the context of the current conversation is that the birth control pill creates a context where women, the costs of sex all of a sudden are much lower because we can feel very certain that we're not going to end up getting pregnant, right? And all of a sudden that big cost that women have had to shoulder over history um, as, as a consequence of their sexual behavior um, and, and that has made their sexual behavior and the way that they behave so different than that of men all of a sudden is removed. It's like taken off the table. And so that's like a really interesting question, you know, and it's something that we've been looking at in my research lab um, recently is really trying to understand, like, how does taking the pill, which is something that makes the cost of sex so much lower for women than what it was historically, how does that change their their mating related behavior? So how does that change women's sexual psychology? And how does that change their sexual behavior? Does it make them behave just like men? Because all of a sudden, you know, sex is something that's not as consequential as it used to be. Or did they still, because they're operating with that sort of Stone Age brain that we've inherited from our ancestors who didn't have birth control, like do women still prioritize things like investment? And are they still sort of really cautious about having casual sex to a greater extent than men just simply because we're operating with this really old brain that we've inherited from ancestors who didn't have access to birth control? I got a feedback Friday letter. This is our advice segment that we do every Friday. And the, this woman had been like cheating with a bunch of people. And she used this excuse that she had hormones implanted in her hip. Somehow they put this little grain of rice, a hormone releasing thing. And she was just like sex crazed. And other people wrote in and they were like, I've had that. 
yes to the sex craze thing, no to the cheating with like anybody who looks at you twice thing. And, but all these other women wrote in and they were like, oh yeah, you get that thing in there in your hip. And I don't know what this is. I, this is apparently some hormone therapy for women who might be a little bit older. I'm not totally sure. And it just it just turns you into a, a demon if they get the dosage wrong, I think. Um, or maybe that's the point. I don't know. Right. Yeah. No, I think that it's got to be the testosterone implant. Maybe. That's my guess. Because they, they do these. Welcome to my they world, lady. Yeah. Yeah. Well I, oh, well, I was going to say, so this essentially turns them into men. Mm -hmm. And so men are like, yeah, no, like, girl, <laughs> like, like, we don't get to do that. Yeah. Like, you don't get to do that either. I'm pretty sure it's, it's got to be the because there's this pellet, this testosterone pellet. pellet. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what it's got to be. That's really funny. So it's essentially like turning um, women into men and they're having to realize how hard it is. To <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, the, the women were writing in and they're like, I've never been unfaithful to my husband, but I will tell you, my personal trainer was stretching me out and, you know, yeah. And I'm like, OK, let, let's leave it there, right. lady. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's, so it's funny. quite funny because any guy who you're friends with, what, you'd have that exact same type of conversation like, oh, man, my trainer was stretching me out, you know, and she pushed on my back and I got to go. I got to go. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Just like what? Uh, but it's. Yeah, it's so interesting what hormones do. Your your book mentioned something also I found really interesting. Children, because when I first talked to you, I didn't have kids, right? So there's a, a line in the book that I noticed this time, which was children that look more like their fathers tend to get more investment from dad, which makes total sense, right? Paternity tests are new. But you didn't need one if your son, my son looks just like me. He And so my buddy even said something like, wow, it's a little you. And my producer was like, guess you don't need a paternity test, you know, like elbowing me in the, it, and just people were saying, wow, it's like looking at you from 1984. And he's just like my little clone. And it totally makes sense, right? Because if you're, if, if it's 500, if it's a thousand years ago, you might not have been totally, totally sure. Or if it's a hundred, I don't know, 10,000 years ago, you might not have been totally sure. Right. Um, but if you are in your little tribe and there's a little you running around, you're like, well, I don't, you know, I'm pretty sure that one's mine. He looks exactly like me. Yeah, no, for sure. It's really interesting because what the research finds is that for women, there's absolutely no relationship with physical resemblance or personality resemblance or any type of resemblance and degree of like closeness. I mean, just, you know, sort of like psychological closeness, like how close you feel. Um, but then also even caregiving and like preferential treatment, like there's there's none of it um, because women's psychology does not need to be sensitive to that because we've always known that any child that we have is ours. And so women can have children that look or act nothing like them and they still invest in them all kind of more or less the same and, and probably based on other things, other qualities. Um, but for men, what you tend to see is that there's this um, like a little bit of uh, favoritism and it's it's all unconscious for sure. I yeah. mean, and maybe there's some conscious level stuff that goes on too, where you're like, I like you, you look like me, we're, mm -hmm. you know, we're cool. You're so handsome. Um, but yeah. yeah, you're so handsome. Look at you. Um, and showing that, that men are really sensitive to those cues and that the more, uh, phenotypic similarity you get, so the more uh, similarity you get in appearance and even personality traits that you tend to get greater psychological closeness and, um, sometimes even greater investment. It seems like men's testosterone is all over, almost like a dice roll. It, well, maybe not quite that, but it seems fickle, right? You see some women, I think you wrote something in the book about you see women, your team wins in sports or you win an election. And I mean, you, like the person you voted for, wins an election. Or, which I thought was funny, you're around weapons, which is actually explains a lot, I think. And if you're a guy, if you want to elevate your hormone levels, you go watch hockey vote and then go to a strip club and then polish your rifle or whatever. And, uh, and you're yeah. good, right? You just watch that spike. Yeah, no, testosterone is definitely, it's a, it's a reactive hormone. And so what we tend to see is that, um, men's testosterone levels will decrease if they like lose, if their team loses, um, if they're just feeling submissive, like in a situation where they have to submit, um, it makes the, their testosterone lower, testosterone increases if their team wins, if their favorite political candidate wins. Yes. If they're around weapons, yeah, so um, if there's, I, I know it's so funny, a beautiful woman or anything sort of, even with the slightest hinting of, of sex, mm -hmm. um, men's testosterone will increase. And, um, and all this is for good reason, I mean, having children. So like you get to be, um, in the position 
position right now where your testosterone is probably lower than um, than it would be. So there's like parallel universe Jordan who's got higher testosterone than you um, because he has no children. Um, when we have mm-hmm. children, um, as men's testosterone level de- decreases, and it does this for a good reason. Yeah. It's like when you have kids and or if you've got a, a long term partner that you're investing in, um, it's not always a good thing to have your foot on the gas pedal of testosterone for the reasons that we talked about with the women with the implant. I mean, it can be a kind of counterproductive hormone sometimes. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't lower your testosterone to the degree that you're going to get pushed around and, um, you know, just all of a sudden become a sort of a, a you know, meek um, underling, but rather it just like sort of prevents maximization of testosterone because it's really adaptive to channel your energy towards your children and towards your partner and, um, and, and not toward looking at the next door neighbor and thinking about, you know, vivid sexual fantasies with strangers. That's what parallel Um, universe Jordan is doing. He's going to the gun range and if after like, exactly, exactly. Looking at some pornography or whatever. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And so women, you know, we get a hard time about our hormones because they they cycle and they fluctuate. Um, But men, you know, their primary sex hormone testosterone is something that also changes and fluctuates. And it's got a circadian rhythm and it's highest in the morning and then decreases during the day and responds to all of those things that we talked about. And so, you know, our sex hormones are part of what creates the experience of being who we are and, and, and all of it is helping to guide our behavior in ways that are actually really adaptive and, and, and functional. And so when we mess with that, like we do with the pill or with that, Im- with that implant that we were just talking about, I mean, it can really change behavior in ways that can not always be necessarily what we want. Yeah. The, some people have reported like manic, just you, you're really turning something up to 11 when it was supposed to be turned up to like five or six and it's hard to control, it's really uncomfortable. Some of that though, I have to guess, is just women being like, oh, I've never experienced this. I think other stuff is clinical where it's like they just can't control themselves. That's like, that's maybe a combination of things. Um, But it's very, it was really interesting reading the email after this particular letter. Uh, There's a lot of trade-offs when choosing long-term versus short-term partners, for, for women especially, of course. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because, of course, for men, you know, choosing a lot of partners is not good for your marriage, but it's good for spreading your genes. And we're kind of evolved to probably spread genes, uh, I mean, to to some degree. But it seems like you don't want to mess with that. If you're a woman, especially, right, you don't want to you don't want to have your short term switch flipped if you're trying to do the long term thing, which I think a lot of women are right. Husband and kids. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I think that. when we're talking about mating, you know, we can think about the types of benefits that we get from our different types of partners as kind of falling in the um, immediate genetic benefits that you get. Like, like if, if I'm just having a one night stand with somebody, um, the, the only thing I'm going to get from them, like if we're talking about things in terms of reproduction, is going to be their genes, right? So I'm just like having a one night stand with you. Um, all I'm getting from you is your genes. That's going to lead to the prioritization of cues that are related to genetic quality. And some of the things that we know are related to genetic quality are things like physical attractiveness, um, because generally the types of things that our brain perceives as attractive are things that are related to health, um, immune function. Um, and when we're looking at attractiveness in men, it's also related to testosterone levels. And our brains, women's brains, see these things, these types of qualities as attractive because, of course, over the course of history, women who zeroed in on those qualities and said, I want, those, I want that as my mate, um, they would have had a greater number of successful offspring than women who preferred different traits. And, um, and so what we tend to see is that when women are short-term mating or just having like a casual sexual relationship with somebody, that's usually what they tend to zero in on is like sexiness, right? Like how sexy is this person? And sexy is just really, you know, like it's the, what our brain is perceiving as things that are related to good genes. Now, when women are choosing a long-term partner, there's a balance between wanting good genes for your offspring. So wanting somebody who's going to be sexy, um, but then also wanting somebody who's going to be somebody who cares and is going to um, contribute to provisioning and caregiving of yourself during a time of pregnancy and and there you know soon after 
um, but then also the, the care of your offspring. And so women have to balance their preference for sexiness and good genes types of qualities um, with also qualities related to provisioning, willingness to invest, willingness to be faithful and, you know, invest resources only in you and your children um, and not also the next door neighbor's children and that and so on. And so, um, you know, when women are in like long term mating, I mean, most women would ideally in an ideal world would have somebody as a partner who has so much sexiness and then also all the resources and caring and provisioning. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of people out there that have all of those qualities. Um, yes, we are very with, few and far between. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's really funny about that is um, there's a lot of research that finds that, you know, men who are sex, like men who are like super sexy, they tend to not always be great at fidelity and, um, mm. and, and they tend to Surprise. engage in more, um, in more short-term mating. So men with higher testosterone levels, um, we know that they tend to have more casual sex. They tend to have more extra pair fantasies. They tend to have more extra pair, uh, relationships when they're in relationships. And, um, and so it's, it, you know, there, there's, a, there's a balance that you have to make if you're a woman and you're looking for somebody who's going to be, um, giving you good genes and then also giving you investment. It's all about trying to figure out where you're going to be putting your chips essentially. It's yeah. like, you know, you've got so many chips you can cash in in terms of choosing a partner and where are you going to put those? Are you going to skew them towards sexiness? Are you going to shift them over this way and have it more balanced between sexiness and investment or, you know, somewhere in between? You, you see that problem with, well, Hollywood or pop, popular, I, I should say powerful men, right? There's just a dispro I think the research shows, and I could be wrong, that there's just a disproportionate number of affairs with powerful guys because they have more options typically. And so, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, totally. And what's really funny about this is, um, you know, we see it with humans, but they've done really cute experimental work with birds where they'll take like a, like a species of songbird where, for example, if the females really like um, males who have bright plumage where they'll take kind of an average male and they'll follow his mating behavior over the course of a season. And then they'll dye his feathers and make him have like these qualities that all of the females like. And all of a sudden all the females are like, and, and these males just become absolute philanderers. I mean, they're just, <laughs> they just are having sex with everybody. And then they take out the dye the next season. And then, you know, he's back to being the really good dad. Oh my gosh. But, um, yeah. So with songbirds, you see that they're as faithful as their options. And I mean, I think that in some degree, you know, th that there's an element of this with humans. Obviously, there are some men, right, who have all the options in the world and are faithful. There are some men who have very few options, yet nonetheless manage to have a lot of extra right. pair of sex um, and, you know, and, and everything in between. But definitely the number of options available to you is a contributing factor into the decision of fidelity. In the book, you discuss that when women see other ovulating women at high fertility, they often won't like that their men, that the, the men they're with are interacting with her. But that means that women can detect other women who are ovulating. Did I read that correctly? Yeah. So this is actually really fascinating. And it's not, and it's obviously not something that we think about consciously, because I don't think that like, if you showed me a hundred women, I don't think I would be able to say, oh, she's ovulating and she's not, and she's not, and she is. Right. Uh, but instead our brain, again, our brain sees things in a way that are very much um, geared toward getting us to do things that historically would have helped to promote genetic replication, right? So reproduction. And so if I see a hundred women, I can tell you who the most attractive is or who the sexiest are and who the most beautiful are. And our brain is likely picking up on all of those cues that are related to fertility. And, um, and then those are informing those decisions. And so my brain, if I see, um, a really sexy woman, I'm not going to want my partner to be near that person. Right. Because, um, that could be a threat. Um, and so my brain is probably just perceiving sexiness cues and even, and I'm, I'm not like necessarily, um, um, seeing it as like, oh, that person is fertile. It's just mm -hmm. like, oh, that person is a threat because that person is sexy. And, um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that for both men and women, it's like the cues that we tend to find as sexy and beautiful in women are cues that are related to estrogen presence and fertility. Yeah, this is fascinating. I mean, this is the obvious question is why would women evolve this? And the answer is because they don't want the guy that they're with who they've invested in potentially partnered with to invest in somebody else, right? 
Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, it's like you have to know your competition. You know, it's like we are, we have to understand who it is that we're out there working against. And same with men. It's like even though men are like, I can't tell if other guys are attractive. And it's that's such nonsense. I, I know that's like such bullshit. <laughs> you got to have your head firmly up your rear if you can't tell uh, like that the six foot five guy like Chris, Chris Holmes with, Oh, he's good looking. I mean, I guess so. You know, like, come so. on, I don't know. come on, man. Yeah, no, yeah. exactly. I, it, it doesn't have to be that extreme either for guys to feel threatened. I'm not super tall or anything like that. Um, I'm, you know, five ten. but even you can feel like, why is this guy being mean to me? Just cause I looked at it or like shook hands with his girlfriend or whatever. Like this is ridiculous. And it's, Oh, he's insecure uh, about this. And you, you can even hear sometimes you get, concrete evidence right like oh well you know he you rolled up in a tesla or something and the guy's like really jealous it's just like geez man calm down it's got car seats in the back for god's sake (laughs) chill um it it is interesting though and and a lot of this hinges on the fact that guys have insecurity around other guys is is case like case positive that guys can tell if another guy's attractive because they're not threatened by the portly waiter at the italian restaurant Right, right, exactly. Right. And it was, was also really interesting about that to me is that both men and women have an understanding of what the other sex is looking for, because there are somewhat, you know, there are differences in the degree to which men and women prioritize different types of traits when they're choosing partners. And so, for example, you know, if I see a woman who has this like really amazing job and she's like a super, like a ton of power and status and that sort of thing, and she's kind of average looking, I'm not going to be threatened by her at all right. because I know that that's just not something that most men are like, wow, like she's so powerful. She's got that's two so amazing. PhDs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like wow. Cool. And um, but like for a man that who sees impressive. that, yeah. I mean, that's a that's a threat. Yeah. And so and and so it's like we both have this um have this implicit awareness of like what plays out in the mating market uh, within our own sex. And it's also that way we can maximize our own probability of getting what we want by being maximally competitive for what we're looking for. Um, but also so we can keep an eye on our rivals. Yeah, it is a little bit of a sad state of affairs and totally unfair. Like, oh, she's got two PhDs. That's really impressive. Meanwhile, guys are like, yeah, but that booty dough. Like, come yeah. on, man. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Like, come on. Is yeah. that it? Give me yeah, a break. Is that it? Um, tell me about strippers and tipping during their cycle and while on the pill. This was just fascinating. I was just thinking like, wow, you can you can put a dollar amount on this. That was not, I did not expect that. Yeah, no, that was a really brilliantly done study, and um, and it was a study that was done at a uh, at a strip club, and of the researchers, <laughs> they, of they course, must have had a great yeah. time running this. I, I was gonna say they had a line of research assistants out the door, yeah. like men saying, "I would love to participate in yeah. this study." I'm like, super please. interested in hormones, guys. Yeah, <laughs> it's like this is hormones, right? It's like hormones. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm totally into that. Um, no, they, they, followed, they worked with uh, women who were working as dancers at a strip club, and they had them all keeping a diary over the course of, uh, I think it was two cycles. And all that they had to do is every day they logged in, whether or not they're working, how many hours they worked, um, how much tip money they earned, and then did you get your period today, yes or no? And so they logged this over the course of two cycles, and then the researchers took the diaries. And the first thing that they did is they divided the diaries into two piles. One was a pile that was uh, kept by women who were using hormonal birth control, so women who are on the pill or on the hormonal IUD or what have you. And the other stack of diaries was the diaries of the naturally cycling women. And then what they did is they mapped the tip earnings onto the women's cycles, Um, Because they asked the women every day, did you get your period? And so they were able to know when the first day of their cycle was, right? And that is the the day you get your period is the first day of your cycle. So they track that there. And then they look and see where the end of their period is. And then they sort of bisect that in half. It's usually around day 14 where ovulation is. And you're able to see when estrogen is rising in the cycle and when fertility is high for women who are naturally cycling. And then you're able to um, look at women who are using hormonal birth control um, and see whether or not they also have, um, you know, are there any differences in tip earnings that they get as a function of their cycle because they don't have changing sex hormones the way that naturally cycling women do. And what they found was that for women who are naturally cycling, you see that tip earnings, the average amount that women were pulling in each shift 
um, was increasing as a function of estrogen in the cycle. And in particular, what they find is that during that period of time, that five or so days prior to ovulation and then the day of ovulation itself, um, that period of time was earned by or was marked by having really high tip earnings. Wow. So they earn the most money across the cycle right during what we call the periovulatory window. It's that five days prior to ovulation and then on the day of ovulation itself when sex can lead to conception. And during that time, women are earning the most tip earnings. That's so funny. Um, and then it falls when when estrogen levels fall in the cycle. Mm -hmm. And then when estrogen levels climb a little bit in the second half of the cycle, you also see a little bit of an uptick in earnings again. And what this is showing us is that men are just you know, instinctively responding to these cues that are related to the probability of pregnancy from sex and that men are finding that these fertility cues um, as being really intoxicating. And we know from research that men, that men prefer the scent of women when they're ovulating. So they like the way that their skin smells more. They tend to find them more attractive. Um, they, I mean, and in, in, in this study like showed it perfectly. I mean, this very non-reactive measure um, that quantifies how much interest men have in women showing that that as estrogen rises, that you get this increase in tip earnings. And then when they compared this to the natural or the, pardon me, when they compared this to the women who are on the pill, what they found is that there was no such increase for the pill takers. And of course, when you take birth control, um, it prevents you from ovulating. So you never get that big increase in estrogen. It keeps your estrogen levels really low. And the entirety of your cycle when you're on the pill is you have a, this pill that has relatively low levels of estrogen and then relatively high levels of this synthetic progesterone or progestin. And you're getting that same hormonal message every day. And what we see is that um, th there's no real differences in tip earnings across the cycle. They earn pretty consistently across and they never get to that high that huh. is reached by women who are on the pill or not on the pill who are, right. on, who are naturally cycling. That's so interesting. And so if, if you're a part-time exotic dancer, then choose your shifts based on the peri, it was a periovulatory window. Is that what it's yeah, so the five days prior to ovulation and then the day of ovulation itself. So like usually if you have a 28 day cycle, day nine to day 14 or 15, yeah, work work that 10 hour shift. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's just it's like, work that it's going to be worth it. I'll say yeah. you can just take the rest of the month off. Yeah. You know, and yeah. just like really work that those days of the cycle. That I mean, is yeah, I so think freaking interesting, man. I, I you know, it this, is. This is going to make me sound gross by association, but I don't care because it's for science. When I was in law school, I used to go out all the time, of course, because I was in college. And I had a friend and he would say something like, that girl over there is on her period right now. And I would be like, how do you know this? And he would go, they're a little bit shinier than the other women. Look around. And I he was so he would get like we would have drinks and I'd be like, all right. Well, it was one time where I was like, this is BS. We got to figure this out. And he just went around asking everyone. And if in a lot of them were like, excuse me, but we're like, no, 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 it's a thing, you know, but he would try to come up with an explanation. Some people were offended, but a lot of them were like, yes, no. So we actually did this a few times and he was very often correct. That's fascinating. Yeah. So I had, I had a student, I teach this really fun class called evolution, sex, and the brain. Mm -hmm. And we're like talking about all of these kinds that of things. That sounds so interesting. My goodness. It's super, it's, yeah, it's so fun. And I, and I was I had this student in my class, and after class one day, he came up and he said, "I have this, I have this skill, superpower." And he's yeah, he's like, "I have this superpower," and um and and I know you're gonna think that it's crazy, but I've I've had a hundred percent accuracy on this. He's like, "I can smell from a woman's breath whether or not she's on her period." That's interesting. Wow. Yeah, and he's he's like, "There's something in their in their breath that I'm picking up on, and I'm always right. I've never been wrong." Wow. Wow. And I'm like, what is that? That's also like, something you don't necessarily want all the time. Like you're right. ordering at McDonald's and you're like, I don't need to know that. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> I know. Well, it's so funny because he's saying that to me and I'm like, okay, well, you know, that's really interesting. Just, pot, but just dumping Tic Tacs in your mouth. Like, <laughs> yeah. really? Tell me more. Yeah. Like, Tomorrow, though. Not today. More. Maybe next week, actually. Yeah. We'll have this conversation. I mean, it's, it's, it's so fascinating. And what's also really interesting <laughs> about that is that if that if there is something – that you can pick up on. I mean, that's something that you could use as a as some sort of a metric. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Cause I'm like, there's gotta be something that that you can be measuring that'll give you insight into hormones that, you know, that we 
aren't able to do yet. Because one of the big things in women's health right now is a lot of people are trying to come up with ways that women are able to better keep track of what's actually going on hormonally with themselves. Because I mean, it's like, especially, you know, as women go through the perimenopausal transition and like with pregnancy and or that somebody's trying to get pregnant and their fertility, it's like women want so much information about what's going on in their bodies. And it's so hard to get it in a way that's like, cheap and easy to get and is available to everyone. And so everybody's trying to figure out like, how can we measure hormones cheaply? Like, how can we do this without taking blood? How can we do this where women can measure this every day so that way they can see how their cycle is performing? Right. And so whenever I think, whenever I hear something like that, I'm like, there's got, like, what is it? And can we measure it cheaply? Because yeah. um, as soon as as soon as soon something like that is available to women, I think it's going to be like, it's going to change the way that we do things like tracking, for example, the menopausal transition or, or fertility for women who are trying to get pregnant. It seems like that's a, a breath, we're a breathalyzer away from being able, I think I said breathalyzer, we're a <laughs> breathalyzer away from being able to detect that. Because if that guy can smell it, and the human nose is not as that sensitive, right? I mean, right. It's like those dogs that can smell cancer, no human is like, I think you have cancer, right? It's it's <laughs> more like right. maybe if you had a pastrami sandwich, I could detect that, but that's that's about <laughs> as far as we go. Um, that is just that's that's quite a superpower. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, by the way, has that stripper study? Sorry, exotic dancer study has that been replicated? No, I don't know that anybody Guys, has even tried to somebody. Get after it, scientists. I'm exactly. something of a scientist myself. Yeah, that seems like yeah. an opportunity to just, you know, make sure that this is, study is just hammered down properly for, for the sake I, of science. I would think that there would be a bunch of scientists trying to replicate yeah. that. I think that I think that the fact that it hasn't is a reflection of the fact that um, we are seeing a lot more women going into into science. Maybe. And so. I don't know why a women, why wouldn't women also be interested in this? I mean, it's it's not maybe as interesting as it would be to men, um, but they they would have no problem getting research assistance for sure. They would have, like you said, a line out the door. Uh, what is the the method by which the pill works? I mean, without getting super super in the weeds, because look, we know it prevents ovulation, but what is the what is the mechanism using as many or using as few of those? Ten dollar words Big, is possible. Terrible words. Yeah. yeah. So essentially, it's it's fooling your brain into thinking that you just ovulated. Okay. And so after you ovulate, like one of the things that I talked about is the first half of your cycle is just all about releasing estrogen, and that's what happens when an egg is getting ready to be released. After that egg gets released, that empty egg follicle is what starts releasing that other hormone, progesterone. And when progesterone is being released, that actually tells the brain, don't stimulate the egg follicles because you just ovulated and we want to see whether or not that, that egg gets fertilized and implants. And so when you have progesterone getting released, your brain doesn't stimulate your ovaries. And so what the pill does is it gives you this daily dose of uh, uh, the synthetic progesterone or a progestin. And this is what tells your brain not to stimulate your ovaries. And so that's how it works. I would love to get some stories of women who met men on or off the pill because the preferences, the change in preferences is very interesting. And you see a lot now in the news about, uh, well, it's sort of like clickbaity stuff, like the birth control pill makes women choose effeminate men. And it's yeah. a, turning it into this like whole societal crisis instead of something that's kind of a temporary effect that some people maybe experience. Right. Yeah. So there is some research that finds that women who have chosen their partner when they were on the pill and then they discontinue the pill, that on average, it can create some differences in how women feel about their partner. And what's really interesting about it is that what it finds is that it can either increase or decrease your attraction to your partner. And so for some women, when they go off of the pill, because the pill is oftentimes, I mean, it, 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 kills your free levels of testosterone. So it, it, it causes the release of what's known as sex hormone binding globulin, which binds up all your testosterone and makes it unusable. And when you're not ovulating, that combination of things tends to kill libido. And so a lot of times when women are on the pill, their sex drive goes in the toilet. And when they go off of it, all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, sex. And then they're really into their partner and they're super attracted to them. But for some women, they go off of it. And even though they're having this increase in sexual desire, they're realizing that their partner isn't really what 
they want right. and like, oh no. And that does happen. Um, and it's not, it doesn't happen most of the time, but it does happen. And it's possible. I mean, it's like, we know that hormones nudge our partner preferences. There's been research for decades showing that like, for example, when estrogen is rising and high across the cycle, that this tends to make women almost more shallow. It's like all of a sudden we're really into all of those genetic quality kinds of cues, things like sexiness and symmetry, facial symmetry and testosterone markers. And, um, and women, women aren't having any estrogen surges in the cycle. You're never getting that at, you know, sort of cueing into these things that women find sexy. And it's possible that for some women, because they're not really prioritizing those kinds of cues when they're choosing their partners, that all of a sudden when they're off the pill and they start to care about those things again, that they realize that their partner isn't really hitting all the right buttons. Um, and and th that can be really upsetting. I've talked to women who've gotten divorced and I've talked to women who've, you know, had really tumultuous breakups that happened as a result of going off of hormonal birth control because they realized like, oh my gosh, this isn't like, I don't like the way you smell anymore. Um, and then nice. I've also had women who go off the pill and are like, oh my gosh, like my partner is exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> Yeah, so because I'm like so sexually excited to be around them and and I hadn't been, you know, for so long. And so whenever you have um, hormonal changes and given that how big of a role our hormones play in terms of uh, partner choice and attraction, you're going to get these, these changes in sexual behavior um, or potentially um, get these changes in um, insatisfaction with your existing partner. Um, and, and, and we just actually did a, a new study and it hasn't come out yet, but um, hopefully it will be ready. We're getting it ready to submit for publication, but we worked with uh, natural cycles, which is a cycle tracking app for women who are not on hormonal birth control. Um, but we captured new users who had just discontinued birth control. And then we asked them, what type of birth control were you on when you met your partner? And for some of them, it's hormonal birth control. And for others, it's something else or nothing. And we looked at women's sexual frequency of, um, you know, over the course of uh, multiple cycles, and then looked at whether or not we had differences in uh, the frequency of sex uh, between people who chose their partners when they were on the pill or women who um, chose their partners when they were off. And what we, what we find is that you get more sex um, within these couples that were chosen uh, when the woman was naturally cycling. So they're having more sex across the cycle wow. um, relative to um, women who chose their partners when they were on the pill. And again, this is just consistent with the idea that if you choose your partner when you're off the pill, that you're going to be going through this regular fluctuation where you have this period of time when estrogen is kind of driving the bus in terms of the brain and estrogen really likes those sexy qualities like testosterone and good genes markers and somebody who's got signs of good immune functioning and all these other things. And, um, and women who are on the pill don't have that. They don't go through that period. And, um, and it seems like what's likely happening is when you go off the pill and everybody's naturally cycling is that for women who chose their partners when they were going through that, they're experiencing that. They're like, Oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. And that for women who chose their partners and they're off the pill, for some of them, they're going to be having that exact response. And then for some of them, they're not. And, um, and it's because their brain wasn't prioritizing those cues when they chose their partner. It seems like that could lead, well, it, well, the obvious conclusion is that it would lead to less relationship satisfaction potentially, but m maybe do you pick based on f mate investment in financial s stability instead? I mean, maybe not financial stability, but stability instead. Right. So that's a really great question. And there was a study that was done, um, gosh, probably 10 years ago now, where they looked at different types of relationship satisfaction. Um, and depending on whether women chose their partners when they were on or off of the pill. And what they found is that women who chose their partners when they were naturally cycling, that they were more satisfied with the sexual and attraction related aspects of the relationship. So like how much sexual desire do you have? How, like how satisfied are you with sexual frequency? How satisfied are you with your attraction to your partner and so on? And, um, but then they found that women who chose their partners when they were on the pill, that they had more satisfaction with things like their partner's earning capacity, um, <laughs> and their partners, like, uh, partners, like just like how good of a partner they are, like how much of a team player they are. Uh -huh. And so it suggests that women are just kind of queuing into different things and like prioritizing different qualities. And what was really interesting with that particular paper is that they found that women who 
um, women who chose their partners and they were on the pill, that they actually had a lower divorce rate. So really? despite Yeah. So which is really interesting because it's like what so this sounds like a question that you would ask like with your roommates when you're in college mm-hmm. after like smoking dope or like <laughs> drinking too many beers. Yeah. Where you're like, like, what is a successful relationship? Right. You know, and and it's like, what is that? You know, and 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 it, it could be choosing somebody who's just a really good partner and 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 you know and, and financial provisioning and that you feel really satisfied with that it could be the sexual piece right maybe that's what we're i mean nobody really knows right it's just like you hope to have all of it right like yeah. i think all of us when we choose our our long-term partners are like hoping that we're gonna be satisfied in all of these different domains um equally but it's like what is satisfaction and at least you know if we're gonna define like relationship success as togetherness, which I wouldn't, but some many people do say like a successful relationship is whether you're still together. Um, if you're defining relationship success that way, then maybe the pill leads you to choose smarter partners, mm-hmm. you know, like, a, yeah. like to choose more wisely. I don't want guys to be like spiking their wife's pumpkin spice lattes uh, with the birth control pill. But it is right. It is interesting. Like Super th- interesting. Yeah, this is quite fascinating. I, I what do you know what women tend to prefer when on or off the pill? Like, is there? I know there's a photograph experiment where y- you kind of get preferences. Tell me about that. Yeah. So, it, what, what you tend to find is that women who choose their partner, like w- women generally, when they're on the pill, they don't have this preference for masculinized male faces that you get among naturally cycling women. So, naturally cycling women, particularly. If you happen to capture them in the in your study at times in the cycle when estrogen is high, women are really into things like facial, vocal, and behavioral masculinity. So somebody who looks like a manly man and es- estrogen loves testosterone. And, and that's, you know, just kind of the way that it is. And when you blunt um, estrogen levels, which you do when you're on the pill because you're not ovulating and it's a creation of an egg that actually produces all that estrogen. Um, for, for women who are on the pill, when you're not having those estrogen surges where you're like really cueing into these things, you tend to get a preference for a slightly less masculinized male face, male voice, male behavior. So that women just don't seem to be, you know, zeroing in on those qualities uh, the way that naturally cycling women do. And now when we talk about these differences, you know, it can sound alarming and, you know, like, oh my gosh, like women who are on the pill are choosing these like you know, namby pamby girly men. Um, but when you look at the differences, like for example, in the photograph study where they had women like essentially using a little slider scale to create their ideal male face, what they found is that women who are naturally cycling made a slightly more masculinized male face compared to the pill takers. But when you look at the faces side by side, I mean, it's not like you're like, oh my God, like, how could the same woman have, you know, chosen this right. or that, depending on whether she was on the pill or not. Um, instead, they're just slight differences. And essentially what estrogen does is it just makes us more sensitive to minute differences in faces based on the presence or absence of, of high levels of testosterone. You do get differences, but it's they're not so great that it's probably going to matter in most women's lives. For some women, it does, right? And we do know, and I've, I've seen it um, uh, more times than I can count, where you'll have women who have an experience where all of a sudden they're, you know, off the pill and they're like, this isn't going to work out anymore. Or women who are like, oh my God, my partner is like, this is awesome. Um, But for a lot of women, because these are small nudges, it's not going to nudge you out of attraction or nudge you into attraction. For some women it will, but for most women it won't. I realize this is probably one of the creepiest non sequiturs I could ever have on this show. But when, when I think about, we're talking about hormones and faces, Preteen girls love these BTS looking guys, like the boy band look, and they really look like sometimes I look at the photos and I go, is that a woman girl with short hair? And they're like, no, it's a guy with like seven earrings and makeup on. And it's like these guys are really popular. There's obviously some hormonal uh, differences between young people. So in adults. And I'm wondering if that's why they choose these really girly looking guys to be in these boy. Those guys are already young themselves. But there's guys that are that age that have facial hair and they're, they're nowhere to be found. 
Right. That's so interesting. I bet you're right. Because, you know, a lot of those preteen girls aren't ovulating regularly. And so they're not having this big surge in estrogen, which is, again, you know, that's like the thing that really tends to um, make our brain really cued into those um those masculinized male faces so no totally that's really interesting yeah i'm gonna leave it there because that's just about as creepy I, people are gonna be like dude <laughs> be like, what? i don't know yeah i don't know this jordan guy <laughs> but it just it i whenever i see these guys i'm just thinking what woman is going oh he's so cute and the answer is a child a literal child is the one who's thinking that these people are attractive otherwise they look yeah they look like it's like a non-threatening version of a male it's almost like a cartoon Cartoon. male yes a cartoon anime guy with nothing yeah yeah, no like two-dimensional caricature no threatening no not like totally non-threatening yeah no that's that's so super interesting and it'd be interesting to see whether or not like the age at which women sort of switch out and girls switch out of that is coincides with menarche and the timing that they get the periods. Uh, yeah, that it makes sense that because th- I'm not I'm trying to I know that like older women go to B- Backstreet Boy or what is it? New Kids on the Block reunion concerts. That's a totally different thing. That's not what we're talking about here. That's nostalgia. But when I look at, again, like BTS, that Korean K-pop band and, and let's some some of that might be cultural, but I'm trying to think of any boy band that's not uh, that one because I'm not it's not really my scene. There's. There's a lot, I'm sure, and they all kind of generically look like similar, right? They're they're not leaning into the no you'll never find facial even like the orig, OG Backstreet Boys, there was like one guy with a five o'clock shadow to appeal to like a certain demographic and then and he wasn't even kind of nobody even remembers that guy's name, right? Because he wasn't the, the popular one. He wasn't the front man, uh, so to speak. So it seems like it and I feel I'm worried. And I'm worried I'm overstating this, so please jump in here. It seems like women should try to choose long-term partners when they're off the pill if they plan to not take the pill throughout their whole life, which is probably, you know, not something you should do anyway with medication. Right. I mean, honestly, I think um, if I, if, if, yes, if if a woman does not need to be on hormonal birth control um, and she's looking for a long-term partner, my recommendation would be that you that you're not on it when you pick it. I mean, uh, you know, hormones affect the way that our brain does its daily business. And that includes things like attraction and, um, and the idea of being under the spell of a different hormonal profile when you're doing something as important as choosing your partner or even choosing your career. Cause you know, I've met women who were on the pill. They were like a worker ant is how they describe mm-hmm. them. They're like, a, they're like a drone where they're just like work, 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 work. They go off the pill and all of a sudden they realize that they want more work life balance because all of a sudden they're like kids and, and, you know, and, and relationships. And they start thinking more holistically about these other things that are important to them. Um, and then their life explodes because they were, they made all of these other choices when they were on the pill and now they're off of it. And they're realizing that this isn't exactly what they wanted. And so I think that for women who don't need to be on it, for reasons of pregnancy prevention, um, it, like don't, don't, you know, it's like, you're going to be living with these other hormones, um, most of your life. And so, um, I, I think that choosing a life that fits you, um, with the set of hormones that you're going to be spending most of your life with is probably a good idea. Although I would say, man, short term, Use that pill because getting pregnant by the wrong guy trumps pretty much anything else that we've discussed here. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's like with everything, it's 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 about trade-offs. So it's not necessarily that birth control is bad because as you were saying, I mean, there is nothing that will derail a person's life more than an unplanned pregnancy. And this is particularly true in our current environment where women aren't able to get safe legal abortions in many states. And so like not ha- having that as a worry, I think is such a huge benefit to women and not having to, you know, not having your life go off the rails. So, um, you know, for, for women who don't have a different means of avoiding pregnancy, um, then, I mean, absolutely, it's a great way to do it. You know, and one of the things I write about in my book, um, and I'll say it here too, is that knowing everything that I know, I would still have been on it when I was on it. Um, because for me, like the the need to prevent pregnancy and be able to plan and make plans for you know graduate school and mm-hmm. then building my research lab, all of those things um, were so important to me and um, and and it's it's benefited me in so many ways. And even though it comes with trade offs, 
Um, those are trade-offs that I was willing to make then, even though I didn't know I was making them. But now knowing everything that I know, I would still be making those, I would still make those trade-offs. I would just be more informed about what it is that I was doing. I love this. I, I love the career, the career idea that you mentioned. Like maybe don't become a partner at a law firm until you've spent three or six months off of the pill. How long does it take actually getting off the pill before your brain goes, hey, I'm thinking differently? Like is three months seems too short. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, I, know. I think uh, so uh, here, here's and, and it differs for everybody. I mean, sure. for me, I started to notice differences within about three months. Oh, OK. But it can take but it can take a lot longer than that. Right. So, for example, if somebody was making a like, I don't know about my partner. I don't know about my career. I mean, I'm thinking six months or a year. I mean, it took me several years to realize that I don't get overwhelmed super easily or that I don't have, you know, anxiety or, or, you know, cause it's, it's just not, it takes you a while to figure out your self narrative. And, um, and so I think that for a lot of women, it probably would take six months or so before they're feeling like, gosh, you know, I'm really unhappy at my job. Burned out, yeah. Like, yeah, like this isn't what I want in my life. Like, I don't think that you would probably figure that out within three months. I think that would take a little bit longer. It, it seems like also a type A personality who's a partner at a law firm or a surgeon or something like that, taking on extra shifts, you're going to try and plow through that for as long as possible. You almost have to burn out and go, what is my deal? I used to be fine doing this. Am I getting old? And the answer is, oh, I stopped. You also have to be aware that the birth control pill does this in the first place because you might not even put it together that you stopped taking the pill and suddenly you burn out, you might not even notice the correlation between those two things. So right. No, I mean, absolutely. It's like, it's not on the pill box, right? No, this it's not on the <laughs> label. Exactly. I would love to talk more about the benefits of birth control. Obviously, you don't get pregnant. Well, uh, not always. Most of the time you don't get pregnant when you're on it. But what, what else? I, I know it's prescribed for various reasons. And so I'd like to talk about that. Because I think the problem is a lot of people are like, well, I don't, I don't have to worry about this because I'm not sexually active. And then they go in for like, I don't know, acne and they end up on birth control. And it's like, oh, now all these other things are potentially going to happen to me and I, I need to pay attention. Right. So, uh, you know, birth control, when it's used as a contraceptive, I mean, just in terms of, you know, being able to regulate fertility is uh, is a huge benefit, you know, and, and, and in some ways I, I don't think that that we can overstate how important it has been for women to be able to be given a tool with, that they can use to be able to safely and uh, effectively regulate their fertility because until we were able to do that i mean it was really difficult to make long term plans if you were a woman um, I mean, if you think about like educational goals, it's like, who's going to start a 10 year degree program as a female who's like, let's say that you're married or in a relationship and you aren't able to regulate fertility. I mean, there's a very good chance you're going to end up getting benched because of pregnancy. And so there's just really no reason to even start trying, you know? Um, and, and what we saw is that when you, when you look at uh, historical trends of, um, in, in education, what you see is when birth control pills began to be legally available to single women, all of a sudden applications to post-secondary degree programs like law school, business school, and med medical school went off the charts. It increased by something like 700%. Um, and, and this is because birth control allowed women to make plans. Um, and when women are able to plan, they, they do more, they achieve more, they are able to become economically, financially, uh, I guess that's the same thing, um, mm -hmm. and politically independent from men. And, um, and so, you know, when we think about the birth control as being this amazing tool to allow us to regulate fertility, I mean, I think that, um, that it, it, it is an important, you know, it's, 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 it's been a really important piece of technology for women. And I think for that reason, there's been, you know, sort of a tendency to feel pretty protective of the birth control pill, um, which, you know, uh, we can get into in just a minute, but, you know, as you noted, in addition to those benefits, which are pretty huge, um, now birth control is being prescribed for all kinds of reasons, many of which are far less important than that. And so just to give you some examples of that, you mentioned acne, um, yeah. acne, certainly when I was a teenager, um, and I mean, and that was a long time ago, um, th that was being recommended back then. You don't have to do that then, to yourself you know? on this show. We can, we can live no, in okay, yeah, we can, we can, yeah, we can, just, yeah, I love it. I love it. So maybe it is just a river in Egypt. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe it is. So, um, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah. So, no, I, I mean, I was even recommended that in, you know, 
back when I was a teenager um, as a means for um, for preventing acne. Certainly now, I mean, it's recommended almost as a first line of defense. Like if you're having problems with your skin or mm-hmm. if you're having menstrual cycle irregularities, you're having bad cramps or that sort of thing, um, women are being given, and, and I use the word women very loosely because a lot of times these are girls, you know, very young girls, yeah. um, being put on hormonal birth control, um, which has all these effects that we were talking about earlier today. Yeah. Um, that, right. you know, <laughs> that, uh, are, are, are really wide ranging and, um, and, and potentially not what they are really bargaining for when they're just looking for a way to clear up their skin. Yeah. It's a, I want to jump back on one thing. Cause I know someone's going to email me about this. You said that when the birth control pill was essentially invented or approved and, and started to get prescribed that enrollment in university studies went up among women. Some people might say, well, that was just a general shift in society. We can't, that's correlation, not causation. But do we know that? Well, of, co- of course it's correlation, not causation. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, it's, it, that's all part of the, the societal trend. I mean, all that societal trends are is the result of individual people making decisions at the same time, right? And those individual people making decisions at the same time are a bunch of women you know, who are now not being burdened by the burden of their fertility and able to actually plan and say, oh my gosh, like I can actually decide what I want to do 10 years from now or five years from now and not have to worry about getting totally sidelined because of pregnancy. And so it really opened up these, you know, opened up these doors for women. And, um, and, and I think that, I think that planning and having agency over kind of what happens in your life is like one of the most powerful tools that you can have because without it, what can we do? Um, and, and, and so I, I think that, you know, there's been a lot of, um, difficulty around conversations about birth control, just because I, there's a lot of women who feel very much like, you know, you can't talk about the potential drawbacks of something that's been that important to us. Because it has been, I mean, it is, it's incredibly important to us, um, being able to regulate our fertility. And, and there are other ways to do it, of course, that are non-hormonal. Um, but what was really nice about hormonal birth control is that it works really well and it's pretty easy to use and it's, it's pretty accessible, particularly now, you know, that we have organizations like Planned Parenthood that help to, um, you know, provide these services to women who are in low income groups. And so it's something that most women can have access to. Most women can use effectively and most women, um, are able to manage to avoid pregnancy without too much, too much difficulty. But of course, there's all of these side effects. And, and so it's, it's, it's the discomfort of having that, of holding those two truths at the same time that makes people get a little bit uneasy, I think. And, and that's, yeah. I'm, I'm, that makes sense. I'm already uneasy because I'm a, a male talking about birth control. So I the bar has to hit like a pretty high level for me to redline on, on the anxiety around this conversation. I, I'm curious though, you, you mentioned, you said before that we're prescribing this for skin and, and I can't remember what else, uh, regular timing Brand, of periods. Yeah. Cramps, yeah. But in essentially, can I say little girls? Cause they're 13. I guess that counts. Yeah. That's a little girl ish. Yeah. That's a little girl. Person. Yeah, that seems like a bad idea. And again, I'm no doctor, but like knowing all the side effects that we discussed earlier, it's like, oh, this isn't just a I took I took antibiotics for acne as a teenager and I didn't even have that bad of acne. It was just something the doctor was like, hey, if you get a zit every now and then take I can't remember what it was called, erythromycin or amoxis something. And now the insides of my teeth are brown because that's what it does to your teeth. If you take it over a long period of time and oh, yeah, taking antibiotics for five years is a really bad idea because it messes with your gut and all kinds of stuff. So I stopped taking it. And when I had my wisdom teeth removed, the surgeon was like, oh, you took antibiotics on it for such and such, whatever it was called. And I was like, oh, yeah. And he's like, I said, how do you know? And he goes, well, look at the inside of your tooth. And it was like a brown. He's, I said, oh, my God, my tooth is rotten. He's like, no, 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 it's fine. It's just brown on the inside because the, I think it's called dentin, not the enamel, so stuff underneath. Mm-hmm. He's like, it just turns brown with that. I'm like, that can't be good. And he's like, yeah, it's that's... fine. But it, but my teeth, I can't, like if people go and whiten their teeth, that's never going to work for me because the inside is brown. It doesn't matter how white the outside is. And I just thought to myself, I'm lucky, I'm really lucky that I have merely a cos- minor cosmetic issue with this. I'm sure I screwed up my gut biome. I Who knows what else got messed up. But 
we just over, my point is we prescribe things thinking this is fine. Look, her acne went away and now she doesn't have these minor cramps. Oh, oops. We've been giving a 13 year old girl hormonal birth control that's been messing with her brain. And now she's 35 and she wants to have kids and she doesn't literally has no idea who she is off of these things. Right. Yeah. I mean, th- there's so much that you said there that that I have something to say about. And the, the first just, um, it, we all have a blind spot with medication in this way. It's like when you take it for something, you it's like, that's what, that's the only thing you're really focused right. on. Right. It's and then only doing and, but, the one thing I wanted to do. Right, right. Right. And the fact is, I mean, our body, we are not built by an engineer. Like an engineer did not say, okay, now this part lives on this Island. And if you take a drug that affects this, it only affects that. And oh, and if you, you know, and this part of your body is operated by this little cog and sprocket over here, and it doesn't affect anything else. Instead, you know, our whole body is just a big mess of electrical spaghetti that's been thrown together, you know, reverse engineered by natural selection, and everything is intertwined and and into a degree that you would never even imagine because everything affects everything else. And and, and the body is just incredibly messy that way. And so you can't treat one thing, especially with like a pill, which is generally systemic and, and just have it have like the, the one effect. And so we never think, we never think until recently, you know, I think we've gotten a little bit smarter about asking questions about things like antibiotics and that sort of thing. Like, gee, you know, does it make sense to wipe out that that person's microbiome in the service of maybe they have a sinus infection? Yeah. Um, when they probably don't, it's probably a virus. Um, and, and, and that's not a good idea, but, um, certainly for a very long time, I mean, this was just like, they were giving medication like you were talking about off, for off, cosmetic like, reasons in a teenager. Yeah. And it wasn't like, I, I didn't have my face covered. I didn't need like, what is it called? Accutane where it, like, it just dries right. you up because yeah, otherwise yeah, yeah, you yeah. look it's kind of rough. I had like right. the occasional <laughs> zit from being a dirt ass at age 13. And oh yeah, right. every kid has zits. Okay. Put a little sticker on it and go on with your life. No, no, no. Take antibiotics for a decade or whatever. It right. Was. So right. It was right. Yeah. Well, no, I know. And in, instead of saying like, Hey, perhaps you should cut back on sugar or, or like, Hey, have face. you consider what yeah, exactly. <laughs> you about washing teenage- your face, you dirty little prick. <laughs> <laughs> That's what think about with my son. I have a, I have a 14 year old son and it's like, have you tried washing your face? Well, um, mm-hmm. like, cause that'll do it. Like, I think soap, that'll help you buddy. out. I think that'll help yeah. you a little bit. Soap goes a long way, mm-hmm. but, um, I mean with the birth control pill, you know, here we are giving girls, as you said, hormones and just, you know, a, a few things that we need to, a little bit of background to kind of, um, illustrate how much of a big deal this is. Um, our brain isn't done developing until we're in our 20s, right? So um, until it's usually our early 20s, um, it, brain brain development is still going on. And and during the pubertal transition, so when we tra- you know go through puberty, get, and for women, it's like getting your periods, and for boys, it's all the other sort of comparable activities. All of that <laughs> is... Um, <laughs> all comparable of that, activities is a great yeah. euphemism for what goes on during that phase yeah. of life. <laughs> Look, I, I'm trying to be polite. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, but all of that remodeling that goes on, I mean, because your brain is seriously undergoing a major remodeling project because it's remodeling it from like this kid brain, which is just like happy and sunshine and rainbows and like, oh, um, and it, it totally is transforming that into the really complex adult brain. And, and the adult brain is, in, is incredibly complex. It takes a long time to develop. And that remodeling project is coordinated by our sex hormones. So here we are going through this period of intense brain development that we're going through during the teenage years. Um, and we decide that it's a good idea to give teenage girls whose brains are still developing, coordinated by sex hormones, something that shuts down their brain ovarian access. So it prevents um, their, their, um, their ovaries from producing hormones and oh, then yeah. uh, replaces them with a daily dose of the same synthetic hormone every day. And we don't think this is going to affect brain development. Yeah. And like what's what's really messed up about this is that I have only seen in my career fewer than 10 studies that have even bothered to ask the question. Nobody's even asked. It was just like, oh, yeah, let's give this a kid. It's kind of like, you know, I feel this way um, with, with psychotropic medication as well. Like, you know, you see this with um, things like uh, they're giving, you know, Ritalin and, and Prozac and stuff to teenagers. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking to myself, like... <laughs> <laughs> like no way. Like yeah. there's not enough studies showing like what this actually does then to long-term development. And and the and looking at this question with uh with birth control pills with girls, the few studies that have actually bothered to ask the question 
seem to indicate that if you go on the pill during development, when your brain is still developing, that it might put you on the road for having a greater risk of major depressive disorder throughout the rest of your lifetime, even after you go off of it. I was going to ask if that had anything to do with depression or even maybe like postpartum depression or anything that triggers depression, because if you're the, the same way, like going on anabolic steroids messes with your natural endogenous testosterone that's it sort of seems like the same thing and by the way anabolic steroids highly illegal right but are basically the the male version of 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 kind of what we're giving to 13 year old girls to get rid of their acne not quite the same but it's but yeah i mean it's the same thing you're giving them a systemic drug that has widespread effects from head to toe Right. And it's illegal for men to take steroids. I mean, to, you know, have them available yeah. because of, because they have these like widespread, these wide ranging systemic effects. Right. But for birth control pills. Yeah. It's like, oh, you've got a, you've got cramps. Yeah. Take the pill. Like, no, nobody on earth would go, oh, are you a little like my son is quite small for his age. And I was like, oh, are there I know when I was a kid, there was a kid who was really small and they gave him some sort of growth hormone or something. And they're like, oh, yeah, we don't do that anymore. We do not do that anymore. And I was like, oh, really? And they're like, yeah, that's not good. We it's better to be small than the side effects of taking this. And it's like, and I was like, oh, my gosh, because, so, you know, Ryan turned out OK, but he's also like seven feet tall now because they overdid right. it or something. And I was like, holy crap, um, he's really tall. Super. It's ridiculous how tall this kid got. Um, and he probably had a growth spurt and they gave him all this stuff. But you would never go, you know what, Jaden, you are a little small for your age. You should take anabolic steroids. Meanwhile, a 13 year old girl walks in and is like, I have zits and my back hurts sometimes or my stomach hurts sometimes. And they're like, take this for like the rest of your life until you want to have kids. So of course it's suppressing stuff. And then you go off it and you're like, wow, I feel horrible. My brain doesn't know how to adjust to this new reality. Well, right. And when you think about, you know, if, uh, you know, and I wish I had a figure, I would love to show a figure, but you know, for naturally, yeah, a graph, like for a naturally cycling woman, you go through these periods of, you know, escalating uh, estrogen that goes on in the first half of the cycle and then it decreases and it increases a little bit. And then progesterone is really low in the first half of the cycle. And then it rises in the second half and then falls. And it's like when you're going through puberty and when you're developing as a, as a woman, you have these irregular cycles and all of these things as your body is learning to communicate with itself. So the brain is learning to stimulate the ovaries, mm-hmm. it's learning to pick up on the hormone, the hormonal messages from the ovaries. And so you get a little bit of messiness where girls' cycles are irregular and this and that and the other thing. But that's all part of like normal development. And that's that and, and that's something that's super important. It's like developing what I, I guess I could only refer to as like hormonal tone. You know, it's like it's like your your brain and your and your ovaries become really responsive to one another and one another's signals, and and that is how you get a healthy functioning body is that you develop this tone that's very responsive and it knows exactly how to adapt. When oh my gosh, there's a lot of estrogen going on right now. Like like what you know, let's go do the high estrogen things. And oh no, it's decreasing. Well, don't worry, we're not going to make it be too jarring. We know just what to do. And when you have a girl whose brain develop is development is going on with um, synthetic you know, hormones in the birth control pill, which is the same message every day, you're not developing that tone. Right. You know, and the ovaries are never even pr- learning, learning to pr- produce the hormone at all because there's no, you're not ovulating. And so your brain is, is used to only getting this, right? The same hormonal message every day. Your ovaries aren't used to doing anything. Um, and then you go off of it. And if all of that was going on during the period of brain development and, and, you know, when, again, when, <laughs> you're a a teenager. It's like, you're, you're not done being built. (laughs) And so all of that could potentially lead to, um, to long-term changes. And, and, and we just, we just don't know because nobody's bothered to ask the question. It was just like, Oh yeah, look, here's this thing that prevents pregnancy. Let's go ahead and give it to teenagers without anybody bothering to take two steps back and say, well, wait, what is that? What is it that we're actually giving teenagers? And like, is that a good idea? And, And when you look at the research on things like depression and anxiety and, um, and that sort of thing, what you tend to see is overwhelmingly it's the teenagers who are suffering from this. So for example, um, when you look at the risk of developing depression on different types of hormonal birth control, um, especially with the combination birth control pill, what you find is that you do get a little bit of an increased risk of developing depression among adult women 
Um, but it's not that it's not that significant. But for when you look at that same risk in teenagers, and I'm defining a teenager as somebody who's 19 and younger, what you get is like a 280 or 300 percent increased risk of developing depression. That's scary. That's really well, it scary. Is. And, and, and so here's these girls, you know, because we talked about the benefit of, you know, like the big benefit of birth control, which is fertility right. regulation. And it's something that for some women, it's going to be worth all the costs that we talked about um, at, the, at the episode we recorded earlier. But for something like acne, like I think that if you told women or you told their mom, you know, these girls or told their moms like, hey, you know, he, there's a chance you could develop major depressive disorder. And we also don't know what this does to brain development. I think that most of them would say, you know what? I might wash my face a little bit more carefully. Right. We'll get you the expensive face care shampoo instead of the pill. Right. Yeah. Instead of the pill. But these conversations aren't being had. And and I don't think that it's because, you know, I I like to think most people's doctors are pretty well-meaning and they mean to take care of their patients. I just don't think that they're thinking about it. I don't think that they are. Why my dermatologist gave me antibiotics for five, like it was literally like five or six years. She was just thinking, ah, this is probably fine. But she was a hundred years old in the early nineties and she wasn't used to thinking that there could be knock on effects from this. And she wasn't reading journals. She didn't use the internet. Right. And I think I said face care shampoo. Everybody knows what I mean. Right. That's not a real thing. Um, it sounds like with, with the pill, the female body turns into a symphony without a conductor, right? Where they're just like, okay, so the drums might play, the people might play, the, 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 they're, they're trying to mesh with one another. They're doing maybe the best they can. And it might even sound okay if you're just in one section. And then later the audience comes in and the conductor comes back because you want to have a baby. And, it's, and the guy's just like, what the hell have you been doing for the last 10 years? This is horrible. And there's no, they're out of practice, they're out of sync. And it's like they've never played together before, and that's horrifying. yeah, that's uh, yeah, it is. And I mean, honestly, I think that that's that's actually a really good analogy because in a lot of ways, normally it's like the you know the brain is telling the ovaries what to do, and then when the ovaries producing hormone, then that kind of tells the brain how to conduct. You know, it's like mm-hmm. oh, okay, too much tuba, you know, yeah, and they yeah, start to like yes. <laughs> decrease that. A theme and, in your um, house, too much tuba. <laughs> It is. It is definitely theme my house. And um, and so you get that like really nice feedback loop between somebody who's in charge of the uh, what's happening and then the activities that are going on in the ovaries. And what happens with the pill is like you said, I mean, it's just like music is being played and, and it's not being controlled by anybody. It's just like being released and the brain is just having to figure out how to deal with it. And, and it's not learning how to adjust to hormonal variation. It's not it doesn't learn how to um, tell the ovary. I mean, it's um, all of that is potentially problematic, but we don't know because nobody's bothering to ask the research question. Do we know what, this is maybe too in the weeds, but do we know why it might cause depression? I know I've read something about brain shifting memories around that's, that gets an inhibited and it can make us feel like our lives lack meaning. Do you know what I'm talking about at all? Well, so th- there's a few things. So one is the the blunted uh, stress response that we talked about last time. And um, stress is something that occurs in our body when bad things are happening, but it's also something that happens when good things are happening. And, um, and so having regular bursts of stress um, and regular bursts of stress hormone, uh, you know, is one of the ways that I think that our brain learns to appreciate that it lives a meaningful life, right? Like if you have no nonstop flatline stress, that means that your life is pretty boring and there's probably not a lot that's meaningful going on because when meaningful yeah. things happen, it, it increases our stress response. Um, excitement, you know, those sorts of things increase stress in addition to the, to the bad things. And so lacking like regular ups and downs from our stress response, um, is potentially one mechanism by which you sort of develop this kind of flat line where everything is just kind of blah. And then yeah. that doesn't really make anybody feel good. What is that uh, called? Another- anhedonia? Is, or yeah, is anhedonia. That yeah, no, that's like a real, that was like a nice 10 cent word you just threw out there. Yeah, like from yeah the- 10 cents only. <laughs> <It was> like, <laughs> yeah. from, from the psychology literature, like that's a good yeah. one. Um, yeah, I know. So the yeah, lack of pleasure, I mean, just like where everything just feels kind of, and, and that's one of the, the, the sort of, um, key defining features of, of depression is, is anhedonia. Finding joy so in basically nothing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know. Sounds, sounds great. Doesn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's, um, there's also just lacking the release of, of, or exposure really at all to, um, endogenous progesterone, 
which is, you know, the women's other sex hormone. And uh, it is, even though estrogen is the one that gets all the attention, um, progesterone is actually super good for the brain. It's, um, it's, it's, it's really good for a lot of things, but, um, just keeping the brain happy and calm and smooth, uh, running smoothly is something that progesterone is really good at. And it's good at this because when it gets metabolized, it releases this, uh, compound called allopregnanolone and allopregnanolone, um, activates like the chill out program in our brain. Yeah, I remember like, we like, talked about this. Yeah yeah. 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 So you like, you hit those chill out switches and it was really good at um, it's it's inhibitory, so it like causes our brain to just kind of like this, and it's very um, relaxing. And uh, pro- like the progestins in hormonal birth control, because they're made out of testosterone, usually uh, they don't get metabolized on the same pathway. They n- you don't release allopregnanolone. Women's um, who are using birth control, they have significantly lower levels of allopregnanolone, and so their brain is probably not able to chill itself out as much. Um, and obviously when you get that, you can get major anxiety and yeah. anxiety that's unrequited. Like if you, if you're feeling anxious all the time and can't solve it, that leads to depression. I mean, anxiety and depression are, are about, you know, they're two sides of the same coin. What about oxytocin signaling? Is that left alone? I, I think I've read this in your book, but it could be in, from another article. There were some women that had trouble recognizing expressions in babies. And that was a little confusing because if you've had a baby, right, you're not on birth control. So how does, does that effect stick around after you've stopped taking the pill? Is that what I'm understanding? No. Well, so we don't know yet about that, but, um, but what we do know is that women who, yeah, so women who are on it, seem to, um, they seem to have dysregulated oxytocin signaling. And so they've, they've studied this a couple of different ways. Um, they've done it where they've done, uh, intranasal oxytocin and then just seeing whether or not the, the brain's pleasure pathways light up in response to seeing faces of people that they love, um, which is generally what happens when oxytocin is on the scene. If you like see a picture of like your wife or your children, um, your pleasure centers in your brain will light up and it'll be like, yay, it's people I love. Um, and, uh, what they found is that for women who are on birth control that you don't get that. So you give them some ox- oxytocin and their brain is just like, you know, they just see it as just another person. Yeah, um, and yes. which is really kind of scary and, uh, um, yeah, scary and yeah, sad. And, well, yeah, it is scary and sad. And it also like, um, I know for me, and, and we talked about this a little bit last time, but for me, when, I mean, it's my six, I think it was a six week visit after I had both of my kids, they were like, all right, what are you doing for birth control? You know, what are you doing for birth control? And, uh, and I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm breastfeeding. And they're like, well, that's not going to cut it. Cause some women ovulate when they breastfeed, which, which is true, but I, I was not. And I know I was not because I'm in tune with my cycle And, uh, but I mean, they, they tried to put me on, um, progestin only birth control pills, um, while I was, uh, breastfeeding because, um, apparently it doesn't get in the milk, which I don't know that I believe. Um, but you know, uh, better than pregnancy, I will say like, I I would not, (laughs) I would not have wanted to have another baby right after the baby, but I probably would have done something different, but I wasn't ovulating. So I didn't have to worry about it. Um, but yeah. Anyway. So when you think about that, when (laughs) there's a lot of women who are being put on this at their six week appointment, um, when those attachment things are still happening with mothers and children. And, and you know, a lot of women, like if they're not breastfeeding, like and they know it, like at the hospital where they're like, I'm not breastfeeding, um, their doctor will put them on birth control right away. Um, which again, when you think about the importance of oxytocin to bind, you know, bonding with your infant and all of that sort right. of thing. And there hasn't been any research that's done on, on this particular issue. So like I have not seen um, a single study that's looked at uh, hormonal birth control use, um, and bonding to, uh, offspring. Uh, but the research that I've seen in, you know, in adult women, like looking at other attachment figures of so partners and and so on, um, suggests that there could be some disruption there. And again, we don't know the answer to it because it's, nobody's really asking the research questions. Um, it's like, it's like, we're just, we're just, you know, I, and I, I feel like, for the last however many years, with 60 years, um, we've been doing this experiment on women that they didn't even know that they had consented right, to. Right, you're not recording the results necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're not yeah. even necessarily recording the results. So it's like we don't, you know, when you look at how much society has changed in the last 60 years and the, the differences that we get in rates of problems with mental health and all of these other things, it's like we have absolutely no idea because every, I mean, our, our society has changed so quickly in the last 60 years. Um, but like, it would be surprising to me 
if there weren't some of the differences that we see in things like risk for mental health and, and increase in um, postpartum depression and that sort of thing that aren't um, impacted in some way by uh, our yeah. use of hormones. Yeah, like everyone wants to blame participation trophies or something. And it's like, well, maybe it's the fact that we've been taking, having, uh, the, uh, the I don't even know what the percentage is, a huge number, millions and millions, tens of millions of women taking this hormone from an early age. I, I don't know. I mean, that seems more likely than TikTok being the root of all evil. Not that I'm a fan of TikTok either, but it seems more likely that that's, that's causing the problem than participation trophies or, or, or cell phones. Right, right. Well, I mean, I think that it's, I think it's, you know, and obviously it's a combination of all these different things. Yeah. But I mean, I, when you look at the risk of um, mental health problems in young women, I I just can't help but think that that hormonal birth control isn't a really important player in this conversation. Um, Because you add that to, you know, so we already know that young girls when they're on it are at a much higher risk of developing depression than adult women, um, probably just by virtue of the fact that their brain is still developing and that their developing brain just can't handle that shutdown of their ovaries. Mm -hmm. um, Because I'm sure that it causes a wider spread um, sort of set of changes than, than we get in adult women. But you you take that and then you add to it, you know, the like social media and all of these other things. I mean, it's just like a, a perfect storm of um, environmental influences that are not great for for mental health for young girls. It seems like if women go off the pill, they should tell people around them to look for signs of depression, right? Because when you're experiencing it, you just believe you believe that there's a reason for it. Your mind's going to rationalize that. Oh, exams are really awful. My boyfriend's being kind of a jerk. And like, I just haven't hung out that much with my friends. And I don't know what I'm going to do with my major. And it's like, well, that's all maybe true. But the truth is, you're also going through through hormonal hell. And you don't know about it because you stopped taking the pill or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Starting. Yeah. Yeah. Starting or stopping. You know, I think that it's so important that, um, that people know about the possibility of, of effects that can happen from, from having hormonal changes in that way. So that way we have people looking out for us. Cause the fact of the matter is, as you were saying, it's like our brain tells itself stories about what's going on all the time. I mean, the left half of our brain, which is like the communication center is really just a spin doctor, just making up stories about why we do things. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, I must be, I must be thirsty because I'm drinking water. Um, you know, it's like, it just tells the stories. And, and, and like you said, it's like, if, if we have depression from that's creeping in for some reason, including, you know, hormonal birth control, like, we just think like, gosh, like nobody likes me. Like mm. my friends all seem to hate me now. Like, oh, or like, gosh, my job just sucks. Like it used to be so much better than what it is now. And we yeah. come up with all of these stories about why it everything must be is my happening. new manager, but it's, you know, maybe it's yeah. not, maybe that's yeah, not maybe the only it, reason. Right, exactly. And I think especially, um, you know, when we, we're talking about these young girls, because they are the ones who are overwhelmingly affected by the mental health side effects, um, is like, they, there should always be somebody who's looking out for them. Um, and and I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, because now we have this O-pill, right, this over-the-counter uh, birth control that's going to be available to women. And, um, and I'm, I'm concerned about that for the, that reason. So on the one hand, like I, I love that we're trying to increase access to, um, to products to help women regulate their fertility, um, particularly in this day and age when, um, you know, women's reproductive health is under fire. Um, and so I, I, like on the one hand, I'm happy that, okay, we're increasing access. I feel good about that. I don't feel good about women being able to go on birth control and especially this one. And the reason I don't like this one is it's a progestin only drug, which um, is safer than a combination product. So, you know, when, when you're talking about birth control, you have progestin only drugs, which only have a progestin, that synthetic progesterone. Um, and then you have what are known as these combination products, which most birth controls are like most, most pills are where you have um, progestin and then you also have some estrogen and, um, and, and the estrogen piece of it is a little bit more dangerous, um, in terms of physical health. So just, to, um, you know, uh, estrogen, for example, is uh, thrombotic. So it's, what's known for increasing heart attack risk and oh. stroke risk. Um, okay. when you, when you have the pill, 
And so they, they've, they've made this over-the-counter product progestin only because it doesn't have all of those risks because progestins don't have that risk. You don't, you don't have an increased risk of heart attack or stroke. And so that's why they made this product um, the one that's available over-the-counter because it's, it's like safer uh, for physical health. But okay. for mental health, it is absolute trash. And oh, no. the reason, the reason that most um, combination, I mean, the reason that most birth control pills are combination products is because the estrogen piece of it kind of takes the edge off how terrible you feel with this progestin. Um, Interesting. And yeah, and so progestin only products are, are some of the biggest offenders when it comes to the things that women hate the most about birth control: weight gain and mood changes. Mm. And so, yeah, so that's the one that's going to be available over the counter. And I just, I don't like the idea of women or girls getting access to these products. Nobody knows that they're on them. Right. Nobody is looking. Parents don't know. Nobody knows to look out. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Nobody knows to look out for them. And, and they're going on something that can increase their risk of depression by 300%. Yeah, that's I mean, terrifying. I mean, it's, it's just like, it's not good. And, and I, yeah, I really, I really worry about that. So I've got, I've got kind of mixed feelings about, um, about the over the counter birth control. I, 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 I like the spirit behind it, but I, I, I would like to see it implemented in a way that makes sure that women are being taken care of. Um, because I do like that, you know, women are able to access it and they're, you know, without, and they don't have to worry about their parents, if they're going to be having sex. Cause I think that that's important. But then on the other hand, it's like, how can we still look out for these girls and make sure that they're okay? I could not agree more. I mean, I'm doing this episode, this double episode, because I want women and those of us that love them to stop thinking that something is wrong with them when maybe there's something wrong with their medication. And it seems like the access to it over the counter access is always better. However, yeah, we don't, we don't, I don't, it's a nightmare scenario that young girls who are already under fire from TikTok and Instagram screwing with their mental health are now maybe going to take something that is going to make that worse. We just, they're just being dealt a really bad hand the, this decade or so. And it's, it's awful. What do you think of the latest politicizing of of birth control. I know we touched on that a little bit last time, but if you search for birth control on social media, there is just a cascade of misleading videos. And it's like, if you take this, you're going to get fat, possible. But other people are like, oh, it'll make you infertile, which is not great. And you see these testimonials online from health influencers, if you can call them that. And they're, these are not doctors. These are just like random people that are stating birth control can make you infertile. And they're not saying that it happens to one in every million people who take it and they have a pre-existing condition. They're making it seem like it's a dice roll if you take birth control pills that you're going to end up infertile. And they're also looping IUDs in with like the pill and the Nuva ring and all that stuff, just like it's one monolithic thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, um, <laughs> there's a lot of bad information, I think on, on both sides, like on the one hand, like you have the, the sort of prevailing paradigm for so long has just been birth control pills. Once, you know, it's like everybody take the pill and everybody's going to, and, and just take it and just shut up and, and don't worry about the side effects because who cares? And they're just fine. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, on the other extreme end, you have exactly what you're talking about. You have a lot of um, health influencers who um, don't know, never read a research paper and don't, you know, have a degree of any type. And it, you don't need to have a degree to be able to understand science, but they, I have no background in science. To, and, you also have to try and, to understand science. Yeah. Well, right. And you also have to like, like say like factual things yeah. one would hope Yes. And um, say, saying things like, like you're saying, like with the fertility issue, like, you know, that birth control makes you infertile, which it absolutely does not. And in fact, um, there, there's research that shows that the, that there is a, 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 it's slower to get pregnant, like when you have discontinued birth control compared to not, but by like two weeks on average, I see. <laughs> you know, people who are using okay, it no. and not, I mean, it's just really not, um, it, it, the long-term effects on, on fertility are, are not, um, except that when women are on it, it allows them to postpone childbearing, mm-hmm. right? And so what you get is you get some women who are infertile because they waited until they were 35 to start having children. I see. So so they are like, oh, my birth control made me infertile. And it's like, no, actually female fertility peaks at 25. And it's really 
horrible. It's a cruel biological fact, but it's a fact nonetheless. And so it's, you know, that's kind of where we're at. So yeah, you know, I I think that um, it is very difficult to have conversations about birth control without, you know, it's like on the one, it it always seems like it's one thing or the other, like birth control is evil and it's going to make you grow a tail, right? you know, which isn't true. And then it's like birth control is sacrosanct. And how dare you say that it can, you know, do this or that or the other thing. And, um, I, I think that especially for, you know, for a very long time, uh, and, and I think that this is still true to this day, but I like to think that we're getting better. It's like, people don't like to hold on to contradictory information. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it causes dissonance where, you're, you know, where you're I like, think my thinking is a lot easier for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's totally where it's like, okay, well, so the birth control pill is, um, is, is really important for women and we need to make sure that women are able to have access to it. At the same time, it is imperfect and it can potentially be linked with, you know, different types of, of side effects that you should look out for. And they're not one size fits all and everybody's going to respond a little bit differently. And so it's just important that you know that these things are possible so you know what to look out for them. And so then it's like, everybody wants to say like, well, so are you for it or against it? And I'm like, right. neither. Right. <laughs> like, for it in both. certain circumstances. It's, yeah. It's like, no, it's like, that's not I am, what we want to hear. It's like, yeah. I am for, I am for you having all the information that you need to be able to make the decision that's right for you. Because what is the right decision for you might not be the same decision that's right for me. And the decision that's right for you right now might not be the same decision that's right for you in five years. It might not be the same decision that's right for you tomorrow. I mean, it's like all of us, our circumstances change. And it's like, we're all smart enough to be able to take all the information in about what range of effects, you know, the benefits and also the potential drawbacks, and then make decisions about what's right for us based on at this point in my life, you know, it is not like, so for example, if, you know, if you are a woman, like, so I'm, I'm going to think back to like 20 year old Sarah, you know, 20 year old Sarah, when she is not in a relationship and is doing things like dating and choosing partners and, um, and figuring out her career goals and that sort of thing, 20 year old Sarah does not need to be on hormonal birth control when she's not in a relationship. Um, because she's not going to be getting pregnant anyway. And she may as well be having her brain in the absence of these other hormones, you know, trying to figure out who she is and what makes her happy and what job makes her happy and what kinds of partners she's attracted to and so on and so forth. 20 year old plus six months, Sarah, who's in a relationship and also getting a college degree um, and needs to not get pregnant in order to finish those things. For her, it might make the right decision to be on hormonal birth control because it's going to work. And, you know, and and so at that point, I make a different set of trade-offs. And each one of us, you know, it's like you have to kind of weigh what the costs and benefits are. And it's it's always going to be a little bit dynamic. And um, and I think that we can are smart enough to have the conversation that here is this drug that's been incredibly pivotal in, toward, in terms of moving women forward um, politically, economically, and so on. Um, but is also imperfect. And it's something that women have absolutely, I mean, we should absolutely exercise caution with, especially with young girls. And when the benefits aren't potentially great enough to outweigh the risks, then we need to have real conversations about whether or not it even makes sense. Because this off-label use of birth control for things like skin and and cramps and that sort of thing for, for teenagers, like, I don't even know whether that's good medical practice. You right. know, like I like I, I I feel like that should be a conversation that's being had among those in the healthcare industry. Is like, is this good practice at all for the, for this group of women? And because I don't know that those benefits, like, is there is there an acne, you know, clearance benefit that's so great as to outweigh the risk of long term brain problems? <laughs> Yeah, like, no. I mean, like, I, I don't think so. Really, don't think so. W- what about IUDs, intrauterine devices? Do those have a hormonal component, or is it just a metal object in your uterus? I don't even know. Yeah, so there's two different types. So um, there is the the metal device, which is the copper IUD, and that one does not have any hormones. And so um, those women cycle just like regular, um, you know, naturally cycling women, and the um, fertility. Um, regulation effect comes from the fact that you get a little bit of an inflammatory event that's going on in the, in the uterus from the little object and that prevents implantation. And so that's how you get pregnancy prevention with that. The hormonal IUD is a little bit of a tricky device. And, um, so it has hormones, 
um, and the hormones are getting released. And whenever you have hormones getting released in the body, it is a systemic effect. So a, a lot of times you'll hear doctors say that the local I or the that the hormonal IUD acts locally. That doesn't make um, sense. But, it's in your but blood. there's no such. Yeah, I know. There's no such thing. It's like there's no such thing as a local Go back to hormonal. Medical school. <laughs> well, I know. I mean, honestly, like if you, I think that if you said that, if you asked the doctor to repeat that, I'm like, can you repeat that back slowly? Yeah. Like, listen to what you're saying. I think that they'd be horrified that they that that ever even came out of their mouth because it's impossible. And so, what you get because it has low doses of hormones is um, these hormones will still, because they're getting in the blood, they still reach the brain and they're often at a high enough level that they shut down ovulation just the same way all other hormonal birth control does. So for example, when you take the pill, um, those progestins tell your brain, don't ovulate. And that's why you don't ovulate. Um, And the same thing with the hormonal IUD is when that progestin reaches your brain, it's like, hey, don't ovulate guys. Um, but 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 it is a really low dose of hormone. And so what happens is over time, um, women oftentimes will begin ovulating again. And then the the device is working in the same way as the copper IUD because it's also because it's in the you know in the uterus, it's like causing an inflammatory mm-hmm. event because the uterus is like, what the is this? Right, yeah. <laughs> you know? it's like, a paper clip like, do in not here. Yeah, yeah, it's like, do not implant an embryo. Like this is terrible timing, guys. Don't know what this is. But um, so so what's interesting is that women on the hormonal IUD, some of them are ovulating, some of them are not ovulating, some of them ovulated the entire time they were on it, some of them never ovulate. And so it's a really heterogeneous group of women. So, but you know, what here's the question I have, and you don't you don't probably don't know the answer to this, but I'm gonna ask you okay. anyway. Ask me, yes, so, the expert. Okay, you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Yeah. Are you ready for this? So the hormonal IUD. So they put this hormone in there, right? And um, and it shuts down ovulation, like I said, and, it, and like 80% of the women who use it for the first year, they're not ovulating because it's shutting down their brain axis. But by five years, about 80% of women are ovulating, okay? okay. So, so, and it still works, okay? So it seems to be working primarily through the same mechanism, which is that, oh no, there's a paperclip in here, mm-hmm. um, that, that the other IUD works. So then it's like, why put hormones in there at all? Well, that's my question is why do you need the other one that has the side effects if the other one works? I don't understand. Uh, Although no. my mom's friend had a child and he was born holding that IUD like he was won an Emmy Award. So there is that. <laughs> so maybe maybe it's it's because it's less it's less effective. Cause I was like, I, I mean, I don't know, it. but I I, mean, I do know I'm that like, if you're holding like like you just won an yeah. Oscar. It yeah. probably didn't work when you. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because I, I just, I always, it, it makes me, um, it makes me have like, and I don't have a lot of these moments because I'm pretty, I'm a pretty practical thinker, but I'm like, they are just looking to sell their drugs. You yeah. know, they just like want to put the drug in the, and it's not necessary, um, and they just put it in there because it's probably it's fifty a times business. more expensive because it has yeah, the drug yeah, in because it. it has the drug, and 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 it, the drug is what was patented, not the yeah. device. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to patent and, something that's been around forever. Oh man. Or I mean, yeah. to, to have protection and charge because I think yeah. you're, I don't know if IUDs, I mean, is it all medical things that go into the generic or is it just drugs? It might just be drugs that the patent sort of expires. That's, after a, that's years. an interesting question. You know, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that, but, um, we'll see, you know, if, uh, if patents do expire on those types of devices in the same way that it does on regular medication, then my guess is they're going to stop prescribing the hormonal IUD as much as they do now. Cause the reason that it's been so hot is because, um, it's still under patent. And so right. the, the, the drug companies are making a shitload of money off of it. Yeah. Um, and so it really gets pushed by the drug companies, but I've, you know, after I learned the magnitude of women who are not ovulating on it for, you know, after a couple of years, I'm like, then why have it? Like, like, why are the hormones in there at all? And, yeah, that um, doesn't make any and sense. It's not necessary. I don't. I don't think it's necessary. We've seen a lot of media on the left and the right, like you said. The one side will say one thing is an, as an extreme, and the other side will say the other thing is an extreme. There's almost like this weird agenda on each side. Like one side doesn't want birth control to be fallible because they don't want people to stop taking it because it limit it limits the new liberties that women have, but then you'll see right-leaning media that's like, it's going to make you infertile. Some right-leaning media has said 
that women have been silenced and shamed by legacy media, the pharmaceutical industry, and in many cases by their own doctors who sort of gaslight them about their experiences with hormonal birth control. And it sounds, that actually sounds pretty reasonable if you have doctors telling people that the IUD is only local and you don't have to worry about it, or or like that the it can't possibly do these things when we know now that it it can. I mean, it seems like there's an element of truth to some of what each side is saying, which makes this thing all the more frustrating and irritating to deal with, right? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, because I don't think that, um, I don't think that it, it well, A, I, I don't think it should be politicized. I think that this is just like way too important. Is, and I yeah. think that it's something, you know what I mean? That it's that it's like everybody, we should all agree that um, that this is an important issue. And, um, and I think we should all agree that, um, and, and I shouldn't even say agree, we should all recognize that women have been mishandled by by medicine for a very long time, and uh, and that the birth control pill in a lot of ways is no is no exception to this, and and not that um, the birth control pill is evil and make you grow a tail and you shouldn't be on it and doctors have been poisoning women, um, but rather that you know we I, I think for a really long time doctors weren't listening to women when they were talking about like the seriousness of their side effects, and I also think that there is a tendency to trivialize the types of side effects that, um, that, that we have from the pill. Cause you know, when you look at some of the most frequent, like the most frequently occurring side effects, um, it's things like, uh, depression and like an, like a complete absence of sex drive and doctors are like, Oh yeah, you know, well, a little bit of, and it's like, that's a person's life. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like, if, as far as the medical profession is concerned, it seems like unless it causes cancer or gives you a heart attack, you're fine. You know, like it's fine, right? If it doesn't um, kill you, then it's just some <laughs> minor thing. Like, oh, you'll be right. fine. Just right, yeah, just rub some, some dirt in it. That'll fix it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like, rub watch, some dirt in it. You'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, and um, it's too important to be politicized. And I and I, and and I think that um, we can. And again, it's like part of this. The the nuance of the conversation is the conversation is this is an incredibly important. Um, you know. Uh, tool for women. Like having, having birth control is incredibly important for women. And we all need to be champions of making sure that women have access to this. We also need to be sure that women are um, being championed for um, access to information about what they're being put on um, and, and, and having doctors that are going to be willing to listen to them and, uh, and their, their range of experiences. You know, the, the fact of the matter is um, because hormones affect, I mean, there are receptors for sex hormones on almost every cell in the female body, just simply because pregnancy requires almost every system that we have to have a workaround. Yeah, row okay, in the so same everything. direction or, or well, t- yeah, off. Ex- yeah. Right, exactly. And so it's like all of our cells are very sensitive to sex hormones because they have to kind of do something special depending on what our sex hormones are doing. And so when you take a drug that changes this, you know, it causes these big sweeping changes in the body. Um, I mean, it, it's 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 going to, be very uh, idiosyncratic. I mean, there's me a lot going on and everybody's body responds to things a little bit differently. And all of us has different pre-existing levels of hormones and all of us have different ability to adapt to hormonal changes and all of us have different ways of metabolizing hormones. And so there's all these different ways that women differ from one another. We're all given these drugs and there's like a hundred different variations of hormonal birth control. So there's all these different drugs and, um, and then, you know, they do a study where they compare a group of women who's on the pill or whatever to a group of naturally cycling women, and they don't find average differences between the group. And they say, oh, look, no side effects. Right. But it turns out that when you look at the, the nuances of the data, oftentimes what you get is you get these huge differences among individual women in the birth control group. But when you average them all together... It just looks like nothing happened. Oh, that's interesting. Right. So just to give you an example of this, there was a study that was published not that long ago looking at weight changes, which is something that many women report. They're like, I'm gaining weight on the pill. And their doctor's like, no, you're not, because there's no differences um, in weight gain among women who are right. on the you're pill Right, you're just and eating too much and you don't notice it. You're just it. eating too much. Yeah, exactly. You're just getting lazy or whatever terrible thing that they're saying to women. But when you look at the actual research studies, what you find, if you divide up the weight changes among heavier women and lighter women, what you find is that the heavier women in the sample who were on on the pill, they lost weight. And the the lighter women gained weight. And so when you put all these women together and you just average their weight changes at zero. Right. But what what you get are real differences that matter to women. And for some women, it's going to make them very happy. 
And for other women, it's going to make them very unhappy. Um, and instead, you just right. have the doctor saying, oh, well, no differences because, you know, we looked at these two groups. But it's like the world is so much more complex than you can do. Like really simple statistics, like they're oftentimes used in um, in a lot of biomedical research. It's just like not going to capture the the nuanced way that our bodies respond to medication. Yeah, they've got to show the absolute, what is it called? It's been a while since we've been in math class. Absolute value, whether it's plus or minus, it doesn't matter. And so you like weight get, weight change of up to 15 pounds or 25 pounds or whatever it is, is more accurate than weight gain of X. Oh, weight gain of X, zero. Perfect. Well, that's, yeah, like you said, if somebody loses 10 pounds and the other person in the group gains 10 pounds, the weight change is zero. It's uh, zero. Man. And and that's scary because I I'm not an average, right? I'm 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 the person taking this particular medication. Maybe not the pill in this case, but that's really right. scary. I would want the complete info. This is so fascinating. I mean, like I said, I needed another hour to get through everything. I thought I, and I've got notes where I'm just like, okay, I'm going to cover it in the show close because there, there's so much here. I think it's really interesting. I think it, from a guy's perspective. I'm very fortunate that I can look at this and just be interested in the science. But if I'm if I'm a, a woman listening to this, I've got stuff I've got to do if I'm on that pill or thinking about taking that pill. There's there's action that needs to be taken in one direction or another. Even if that action is just doing research and reading your book and maybe rewinding to the beginning of this if I'm jogging and not really paying attention because there's so much in here. And it's just, it's kind of scary because if the birth control pill is this complex, Probably every other medication that we take is really this complex. It's just not been around for 60 years, studied a bunch, and affects maybe our personality as much. But it's it doesn't make sense that the pill is more complex than other medication that we're taking, like, I don't know, Ozempic or whatever. Right, yeah. It, it's going to be really interesting to see um, how all of that unfolds as yeah. well. Like, I think, I think in some ways, it, hormones are kind of uniquely... Um, systemic for systemic, women yeah. just again you just just because of how many cells have to sort of march in a sense. different direction in response to pregnancy but I, I think like with things like glp for example like with ozempic um i mean that's something that helps to regulate metabolism and glucose and uh, and all all of that affects the whole engine of the body and so that that one may end up being like really sort of widespread as well you know I, i've always wondered this with um with uh, all of these psychotropic medications that they're putting folks on, especially kids. Like I, um, my kids, I mean, I'm telling you, so my kids are, are both high school age and like half of their peers are on drugs of some sort for psychotropic Oof. medication. And so both my kids are like, well, like Ritalin or I need something? to be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like that or something for depression or something for anxiety oh, or something for, I mean, it's kind of what happens when you have, um, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I've got my own hypothesis. We can talk about off camera. But I was gonna say, if you're going to say, going to a that. private school, it feels like the parents are just like, you know what? I don't really want a parent. I, and I look not private. Not that only private schools do that. Right. I'm yeah. Just yeah, noticing yeah. a trend. Right. Um, but but yeah. I mean, honestly, though. But so they're always like, well, I don't know. Like, I feel like I need to. And I'm like, you aren't going on anything. Like, I'm not letting a no. thing touch your brain other than like vitamin D. You can take a <laughs> vitamin D supplement, and, and that's it. <laughs> you yeah. know, I can have it's, it's really, vitamins. That's it. Uh, yeah, teenagers, nobody studies them. And they're such a vulnerable group because right. their brains are developing still and they're a pain in the ass. And so everybody wants to give them drugs to try yeah. to get them to, you know, do something different because they're such a pain in the ass. That's right. But no, That's just, right. we just have to, we just have to roll with it. You know, it's yep. just like we have to learn to they're put up toddlers with toddlers that can drive. That's true. Exactly. It's frustrating. Exactly. <laughs> Man, I, I will say the, the the whole process, there's a whole section in your book about birth as well, or different sections talk about this. Do you ever just wish y'all laid eggs? It might be a lot easier. I feel like it would have been a lot easier that way. It would be a lot easier yeah. that way. It probably would be a lot easier that way. I'd love to say some like, you know, sweet things about pregnancy being this amazing experience. And it, and it kind of was, but I don't know that the benefit of all that amazingness is would like outweigh the amazingness of just being able to lay an egg and have somebody else sit, sit on, on it. it for a little while. Yeah, <laughs> just sit on it. Um, you probably couldn't feel that kicking or anything, but yeah, that's right. right. It's like, Trade I, might, I might, I might give that, I might give that up to be able to just like take a break from it for a little bit. That's right. That's true. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate this again. So fascinating all around. Great. Thanks so much for having me.
thank you for checking out this entire episode on YouTube. If you want to follow up on this topic, check out our podcast feed or visit us on our website at jordanharbinger.com, where you can learn more about our guest and dive even deeper into what we discussed today. And remember, YouTube only has about a quarter of the episodes that we release here on the Jordan Harbinger Show audio feed. Any podcast app should have us. Check out the links in the description where you'll find access to all of our shows that don't appear on YouTube, such as Skeptical Sunday, where we debunk topics like crystal healing, GMOs, conspiracy theories, homeopathy, tipping, and even lawns to find out if they're backed by science and or logic. Also, our Feedback Friday episodes where we help people escape from cults, get raises at work, and take all manner of questions from you, the audience, and some of that stuff is dicey. Every episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show has something useful that you can take away and apply in your own life and help you navigate what I know can often seem like the overwhelming and paralyzing challenges of modern life. Thank you for watching, and remember to like, comment, and subscribe.